The following program is the combination of a partial replay of the Robin Abrams episode that first aired on Unfound on November 25th, 2016. The replay is then followed by a December 1st, 2020 interview with a deputy and investigator who worked in Will County, Illinois at the time of Robin's disappearance. You need to hear what he has to say. The episode then finishes with a new 2020 summation. The entire program is over four hours long, but it's worth it. Robin Renee Abrams was a 28-year-old from Beecher, Illinois. She was the sole plaintiff in a suit against Will County, accusing officers of sexual harassment, among other charges, after being fired from her job there as a deputy. On October 4, 1990, Robin drove away from her parents' home. Not far down the road, Robin waved to her father who was headed in the opposite direction. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Now the facts of the case, and these facts are brought to you by my friend Megan Good and her website, charlieproject.org. On October 4th, 1990, Robin Abrams passed her father on the road in Beecher, Illinois. Nobody knew where she was going or if she was going to meet anyone. However, a half day later, her red 1989 Dodge Daytona was found in Harvey, Illinois, with the doors locked and the keys in the ignition. Her camera was in the car, but there was no trace of Robin. Three days later, Robin's purse was found in a residential area three blocks away from the car's location. Whoever took the purse left Robin's wallet, but took the credit cards. However, those cards were never used. Robin had been dating a fellow married police officer, Anthony Marquez. She was unaware of his marital status. When Robin discovered this, she broke off the relationship. What ensued was a two-year-long period of harassment by not just Tony, but fellow officers assisting him in his efforts to make Robin's life miserable. However, despite Marquez being the instigator, he managed to get Robin fired from the police force. In response, Robin in December 1989 filed a federal lawsuit against Marquez and others alleging wrongful termination, sexual harassment, and violation of her civil rights. She was scheduled to give her deposition in the case on October 22, 1990, but vanished 18 days before that. Robin had made statements before she disappeared that if anything happened to her, her family should have Marquez investigated first. Unfound News This past Saturday, while in DeBerry, Florida for a disc golf tournament, I videoed a new Unfound Now regarding the recent disappearance of Alan White from Dallas, Texas. The new episode is now playing on the Unfound podcast channel on YouTube. I hope you will check it out. Next, it's the first episode of the month. You know what that means. The Unfound newsletter came out just a few days ago. If you're on the list, you should have gotten it. If you're not on the list, then you didn't. Please contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com if you'd like to be put on the newsletter list. Finally, my dad turned 84 a few days ago. He's going strong, and in fact, he's going to be coming to Clearwater Beach in about a week. I'll be flying to Pennsylvania to pick him up, then driving him in his own vehicle back to Florida. How long is he staying? That remains to be determined where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Stitcher, Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, Deezer, Facebook, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 
please join us on our podcast channel for the Unfound Live Show. All of you can talk with me and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Eileen. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. And do not forget the website, theunfoundpodcast.com. In fact, within the past week on the website, we posted some important never seen before information regarding the disappearances of both Robin Abrams and Stephen Kocher. Next up is my November 2016 interview with Robin's sister, Jody Walsh. Jody, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ed. Tell the listeners a little bit about Robin, uh, who she was, your relationship uh, with her, and then we'll get into some of the details uh, of her disappearance. Okay. Um, we grew up in a house. There was four girls. Robin was the baby. She was the youngest. Donna, the oldest, then myself, our sister Karen and me. Our dad was a bricklayer and a part-time policeman for the town we lived in. Mama was a stay-at-home mom. Um, Robin, when she was younger, we had always had a pool, and um, you could always find us by the pool, in the pool, um, riding bikes. We liked outside. Robin liked um, exploring things. She was real, um, even little girl studious. She liked to read, a lot mm-hmm. of, reading a lot of books. And uh, she loved school, and we loved our baby sister. Mm-hmm. And she grew up, she went to high school, graduated. Did she go to college? Robin was the first one in our family that went to college. Is that right? Um, she went to um, the junior, uh, the um, community college out here and then went to uh, Governor State where she graduated with a bachelor's degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was the first one that went to college in our family. We were very proud of her, mom and dad and all of us. Wow. Okay, and you were very close to, were all you four sisters very close? The older two, Donna and I, were close. There's mm-hmm. a four-year gap between Robin and Donna, so mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. we watched out after our little ones, our, you know, our younger sisters, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, basically when we had together time, we all, were all together, you know, play Barbie dolls and that kind of stuff growing up, but uh, mm-hmm. when we were... My sister Diane and I, you know, we were in school ahead of them, and yeah. we te- we'd go and teach school to them when they were little, and okay. you know that kind of stuff. But so, how many how many years ready. difference was there between you and Robin? Six. Six years. Okay. No brothers. No brothers. No boys. There's no brothers. Wow, no brothers. that's a lot of estrogen in that family, Jody. Or you better you better believe <laughs> it. It was it was it was fun. It was real good memories for most part of it. Uh, and so, how did she end up becoming a police woman? How did that? How did that all happen? Well, we'll start by the fact that she put herself through college. Mm-hmm. Um, she worked at McDonald's. She even became a manager at a few of the McDonald's and worked, um, you know, worked her way up the rung. And one day, this gentleman came in um, by the name of Tony Marquez, mm-hmm. who was a who was a Will County Auxiliary Officer. He was 42 at the time. She was, wait, yes, 42, I believe, and she was 28, so he's much older than her. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they hit it off, and, you know, she admired policing because my dad was a police officer. Right. And that was something in the back of her mind, I I believe. Uh, I know she wanted to be a lawyer, Hmm. but she wanted to do the different things, like, you know, become a police officer, see how that is. Um... And then work her way up and, you know, become a lawyer. Her passion was helping um, distressed women. Um, I'm not going to go into the background of that because both Mm. of my parents are gone. Okay. But um, she did have a, she had a commemorative letter from a group called Groundworks out in Joliet by helping a lady um, by the name of Miss Brunel. I don't want to give her first name, but she's also missing from Will County. Oh my. But uh, she got an accommodation letter for helping her in the battered children, uh, battered women and children. Mm-hmm. Um, she had a heart for people, and she was always, um, 
always that way, always helping mm-hmm. out people. And she met him there. And uh, so while she was a manager of McDonald's, she was doing lists like on the side, like outside of work. When she was at McDonald's, mm-hmm. she met him. Okay, and he was a police, you know, artillery. Okay. And then she got into the academy in Springfield, Illinois, mm-hmm. to be a police officer. And she did do that. And uh, she got the combination after she was a, oh, okay. you know, the Will County Sheriff's Police, the, the, the office that did hire her, which was one of the biggest mistakes our, our life ever faced was that, yeah. that day. What, uh, you, what, around what year did she become a policewoman? What year? 80, um, 88, 89, she went into the academy. And okay. in 89, uh, she was Will County Police Officer. Mm-hmm. I believe I'm getting these dates right. Okay, that's it's fine. Over 20, it's over 26 uh, years. I understand. Oh. Listeners and, uh, will understand. Great. A few months before her actual tender as, you know, an interim policeman, before she became full force, mm-hmm. she was fired. Um, Tell the listeners well, about uh, that. Robin's boss, I'll just say his first name. His name was John. Mm-hmm. And him, he was a sheriff, John, at the time in Will County. Mm-hmm. And his um, entourage, I want to call him, uh, Tony Marquez and a few other officers that will be named later. Mm-hmm. They were all best friends. They grew up together. They went to school together. And uh, so Robin... Um, found out that he was married. He told her he was divorced. Mm. She found out he was married. They dated for a while, and she found out for sure and broke it off. And that's when the trouble started right there. Um, mm-hmm. Other than the fact that prior to that, he did punch her in the face once, and when she was in the academy, they noticed the bruise, but she wouldn't talk about it because she, she knew what was going to happen. You know, she kind of had a fear of him. This was Tony um, Marquez. This was Tony Marquez. So the same guy that, just to, to be clear for the listeners, the same guy that recruited her to, to be, get into being a cop is the same guy who started abusing her once she became a cop. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. All right. And um, through her course of the um, breaking up and all that, mm. Tony Marquez beat my mom and her the car mom was driving was a, a, a new van, and he beat it in with a baseball bat. She lived out in the Joliet area and had her tires slashed several times. Um, and the baseball incident, mom and Robin had a court date. And they went to the court date, and they found out that the date was changed conveniently mm-hmm. by another judge who happens to be friends of the, the chain of command, let's just say. Mm-hmm. And, and this is a document. We have the mm-hmm. proof. I, mean, I know you. I know you do. The thing dropped. The, you know, the case was dropped, so they never got anything out of that. So from then until the day she disappeared, mm-hmm. October 4th, 1990, this man, Tony Marquez, had over 105 complaints on my sister. From anywhere from... Um, Reckless driving, stalking, phone, you name it. He, he had it. And uh, what mean, Meaning but, that he, di- he didn't have the files charged against him. He had filed them against Robin. Yes, he harassed wow. her in that way, and it ended up going to court. Mm-hmm. And my sister stood at court with my mom mm-hmm. and, and the jury, 12 of them. Mm-hmm. They could only do two charges. Was with, One was harassment and one was something else. I don't know. Out of all that 105, wow. um, and mind you, in the meantime, these records I do have of these arrests, mm-hmm. several of the people that had interfered with her life to make it miserable were named on those complaints as, as people that signed off on the reports, that took the reports, that came to her house with their guns drawn to her head, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. Yeah. And I'll talk yeah. about it a little later. Yeah. Yes. But he, yes. Um, he had, they had gotten her to those two counts. And my sister was found not guilty Mm -hmm. on everything, not guilty. And the judge at the time who was hearing it was Judge Bua, and he ordered an order of protection for my mother and for my sister Mm -hmm. against Tony Marquez to stay away from my sister and mother. Mm -hmm. That was still in effect um, 
it was still in effect till she, you know, left the earth. Yes, I mean, yes. It yes. was not supposed to be anywhere near them. The judge ordered that. That wasn't, now this is an interesting part. Mm -hmm. Robin and Mom didn't request that at the time. They were there to, you know, get her off, right. you know, the charges or whatever. Yes. But the judge saw through this bull crap, if I could say that you on can, here. You can say that. And, and said, you know, this is what I'm issuing, follow it. It was not followed. Not followed. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like me to get into a little bit of some of the harassment? I, I think what we want to do is first is... Explain what the family dynamics what was going on as this was going on. What was Robin telling you? Were you did you live in the area also? Were you somewhere else? Yep. What was she telling her mother? You know, your mother, I should say. What was the conversation within the family while this was going on? Okay, I did not live in the area. I was mm -hmm. um, raising two little children. Mm -hmm. My two children at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but we did have family gatherings. You know, we'd go out to moms and. Robin lived in Joliet in her own little apartment, and Mom and Dad lived in Beecher, Illinois, which is about a maybe 45-minute, I'm assuming 45-minute ride. Okay. Mom, Mom knew what was going on. It happened to Mom. She was in the car when he beat her. Yeah, right. You know, and, yeah. um, but we were close. I mean, she'd come to the birthday parties, and once in a while, she would take my two younger ones, one at a time, because they were, you know, four, no, let's see, yeah, four in, like, seven or something they were like a little that. bit of a ha handful a little bit of a handful yeah, they, well yeah, yeah okay. you know, she has never had children she okay had kids, so and i didn't mm. want to overburden her because <laughs> sure i know how my kids are you know? <laughs> yes Just go and relax and enjoy your time with your auntie that's your special time yeah which they each got to do yeah and um took them to the ball game she was a big Sox fan cubs fan mm. and you know um so we did have that kind of camaraderie um, after, because I was married young, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be 43 years this November, and next week, yes, no, this week, it's the uh, 24th. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And were you fearful for Jody's, for Robin's life at this time, Jody? Were you, were, were you a little uh, worried gonna, about I'm her? Gonna say, I'm going to say after the incident where she was stuck in the cell in Joliet at one time mm -hmm. with 10 male felons uncharged on a class, well, it was a class C violation. And the man that put her in jail, we'll just say Jim, because mm. he was the prison guy there, says, we'll make her the exception to the rule. Stuck her in her cell 10 hours with eight, eight hours with 10 male felons. And this was and because of one of the charges that Tony Marquez this had brought again. It was a trumped up charge. Trumped yes, up charge. it was. Yeah. And um, that's when I had a gut feeling as a sister, uh-oh, something is wrong here. We got to get her out of there. And then my mom started telling us about the time her car was slashed with the tire, mm -hmm. you know, her tires were slashed and, you know, running her off the road. And I go, Mom, why didn't, she goes, well, you have your, you know, you know, you have your family, your kids to take care of. I'll take care of Robin. Yeah. That's how Mama was. You know, yeah, she yeah. Wanna, and then um, I have a, I have to say this on the air. Please. I have a bad temper. And if I'd have known what this man was doing to my sister, mm. I might not be able to be sitting here talking to you. And I'll mm. let you guys fill in the blanks um. there because this would have never happened, ever happened to my sister what these people did to her. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to stop now either. I, I'm going to keep going forward to get you. Mm. What was what was Robin saying at this time? Did she, was she saying? I mean, t to your knowledge, was she telling your mother, "You know what? I can handle this," or "No, you know what? I'm going to move. I'm going to, you know, go move to, you know, Indiana or Wisconsin or something." I mean, well, she did move out of Joliet okay. and moved in with my parents and my oldest sister Donna lived there also, mm. uh, and Donna and Mom and you know Robin would uh, Robin, as a matter of fact, took my sister. My mother and one of Robin's or Donna's girlfriends mm -hmm. out to where Tony Marquez worked in Joliet. He had an insurance company and told them this is just probably approximately two to three weeks before she went missing. Mm -hmm. He said, if something happens to me, that's his office, that's who did it. And mom, over, they already knew it was Tony Marquez. Yeah. You know, yeah. Mom and Donna and it was it was fearful whenever she'd go in the car. You know, you never know where he'd show up or, 
right. you know, what kind of police would be following her and drawing their guns to her head in her own apartment at one time, and five mm-hmm. of them came and were telling her neighbors that she was nuts and a lunatic with a gun and, you know, just really bizarre things. And just so we're uh, clear for the listeners, the reason that this all was going on was because Robin found out she was having a relationship with Tony, and then Robin found out that Tony was married, and so Robin didn't want to be with him anymore, and this was all of his retaliation for this, for that. That's, that's, that's your correct. suspicion. Yes. That's your suspicion. Yes, that's our assumption. Mm-hmm. And along with that, um, getting kicked off the police force was a very big part. The, the, the man by the name of John who was running – Again, for re-election for sheriff. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, they fired my sister, okay? Right. And, uh, uh, not long before her year was up, they fired her. So she filed a sexual harassment wrongful right. um, termination against them. Yeah. And um, like 18 days before she was to give her deposition to her lawyer's office, she disappeared. So it was a combination. It was a combination of that relationship and then this lawsuit that she was filing. And she was right. going to, she, and probably she was, it sounds to me like she was going to win it. And a lot of people were worried about that. So it was a combination of issues. That, yes. Okay. As a matter of fact, she had a six to eight hour deposition given on their side for the Illinois state side. Mm-hmm. And they all had a, you know, they all knew what she was. How, how firm this case was, and right. they couldn't have that because he was running for a re-election. Um, and in the meantime, while she was getting harassed by him, she would go several times to this John guy, her boss, and mm. um, he ended up firing her, saying that she um, would otherwise bring a bad name to the uh, <laughs> police department oh my. On, on things that were going on. I mean... Completely mm. defamation of character. She had a very strong suit. Okay. And I, I know she would have won it, and these people would have been exposed. So what happened the day that she disappeared? What do you remember about it? What are we, You're personally what you remember, and then what are the facts of her disappearing, and then maybe a couple days after that? Okay. My father was the last to see her. They lived in Beecher, and she was going down Goodenow Road, and she passed him. He was coming home from work mid-afternoon, 4 o'clock, mm-hmm. um, and they waved. So they had never talked to her or anything. Of course, she was a 28 at the time, and, mm-hmm. you know, she doesn't have to tell everybody her whereabouts, goings and comings. Uh, Mom and Donna thought that she was just going out on errands. Donna was working at the time, so she didn't get to talk to her, mm-hmm. you know, that day leaving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just here going about my life, working and watching my children. Yeah. And I got a call um, she was, was presumably she was in the car by herself. Your your father did not see anybody else in the car with her. She was alone. Just her in a red do, uh, Dodge Daytona. Okay. Just her in her car. Yeah. Right. And he did note that she had on a white uh, dress. You you could see her dress shirt and her black leather jacket. That's okay. what she you know had on. Okay. And um, where she was going, no one knew. Uh, she was spotted at a gas station, and Tony Marquez was also spotted there. Hmm. Um, okay. So I get a call at 7 in the morning. and The next day? This would be October 5th, okay. 7 a.m. The next day. 1990. Mm-hmm. My, calls, or my sister Donna called and says, you have to come over here. Robin's missing. And I got in my car and immediately went out there. Um, Did you immediately think that... Let's just be honest. What was your knee-jerk reaction when you heard that? What, what did you think? Tony Marquez killed her. Okay. Okay. That was our all of our initial reaction. That was he got to her. He okay. got to her. And um, when I got there with Will County Police that she worked for, a gentleman by the name of the detective's name first name was Steve, and some other people. And of course, everyone was crying, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, we we just tried to hold it together for my mom and. Uh, a couple of days later, they get a call. They found her purse in Harvey. They found the car. The reason why they got a call, Robin was not reported till the next day mm-hmm. because um, Harvey Police, Harvey Illinois Police called and says, we have your 
that we have your car, your, your daughter's car here. And uh, there's no sign of Robin. Um, mm -hmm. So. And f how far is Harvey from where she was last seen? Um, Joliet would be where she was last seen. Mm -hmm. Harvey's uh, probably, maybe, I'm going to say, guessed an hour away. Okay. Towards Chicago. All right. So um, not close. Not like right not down the street. Close. Okay. No, not, not down the street, but it's another county. Okay. This would be Cook County, the Harvey area, mm -hmm. and the other um, would be Will County. Will County. For the Will County Police Department, Sheriff's right. Police, yes. Um, when she, the car was found, supposedly keys were in it. Um, they did find her purse. A, a lady called our parents a few days later and says, I found your purse, and it had her wallet, you know, and um, stuff in it. Mm -hmm. There was also a camera in the car. There was a camera, mm -hmm. and for years we were told there was no film in the camera. Mm -hmm. And for years we thought that the um, state police, because at this time you got to remember, Robin was a Will County officer who was fired. Yeah. So there was a conflict of interest. So a few days later, the Illinois State Police stepped in. Okay. So getting it out of Will County's hands was a good thing because they're the ones that we strongly believe right. have been covering it up. Yes. So now for 1990 to 2012, we believe the just Illinois one, State Just one quick question. One quick question. Where was the purse? Was the purse, you said a woman found Robin's purse. Where The purse wasn't found with the car? No, the purse was found in a lady's yard about three blocks away. Three blocks away yeah. from the car? From the car okay. in Harvey. Yes. Okay. And was just sitting in her yard, sitting on the sidewalk. Yeah, they found the purse and just you know there. the information, and called my mom, and you know got a okay. hold of belongings and. Uh, Anything weird had... about the car? Anything that you remember that just? I mean, we're going to get into how the car got there, but. Anything inch weird about the car? Any blood stains found in it? Did they dust it for fingerprints? That all kind right, of stuff. All that forensics has been. Um, it is an open investigation, okay? Mm, yes, and of course. And there's things I can say in that. Um, but I do want to say there was a, um, a. I don't know how much of that I can go into. Other than okay. the car, even. Other than the car after the Will County police department mm -hmm. went through it mm -hmm. after them and then the state got it okay. the car was given back to the uh car dealership that she had the you know uh payments to they got the car back oh my so i was told there's evidence in the car that they've been taking you know had forensics okay. done a few times and uh that's we'll leave that there but there was okay. I, there was evidence in the car okay mm -hmm. great so what did you find out? There was a there was a witness to the car being there. What can you tell us about that before we get into what happened between 1990 and 2012? Somebody did see the car being parked there. Yes, a gentleman, an elderly gentleman, threw mm -hmm. his picture window because it was a cul-de-sac, and they dropped it off near a street light, so he uh, could identify it. Uh -huh. Told what it was, said he saw these two gentlemen, and he's. Uh, also faced them in a lineup and pointed them out. This is what we were told. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we're going to have to be a little bit more specific. Actually, we're going to have to be a little bit more specific for the listeners. The car was dropped okay. off by a tow truck. The car was dropped off by a black tow truck with chrome. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, it was initially reported as a red tow truck, and the state police did that to deter any um, false information. Okay. That was a letter I got from the state police stating that fact, that it was a okay. black tow truck and that it was, um, the car was dropped off there by two gentlemen and Tony Marquez and his stepbrother, John Romo, mm -hmm. were the two that he identified in the lineup. The, there were the two guys, uh, dri one of them driving, the other as a passenger in this tow truck and were there. Correct. Dropping the car off on the cul-de-sac where the wow. gentleman lived. Wow. So after, so that was, was that identification made shortly after Robin disappeared, or was that five years down the road, or was that right around that time? That was right around that time. Okay. Which we did not know about. 
Okay. So now, now that you, now that you just said those words, what happened? So the police start investigating. You think that they're doing as good a job, even though you have your suspicions about what happened, you know, but you didn't know a lot of this stuff. Because what happened between 1990 and 2012, you actually thought that a, a good investigation was going on. But what did you find out? What did you think over those course of those years? I had all trust in the state police. I, I did not have any reason to doubt them. I've always thought that they were upright, outstanding. They're, that's our state police. Mm-hmm. Sure. And. Um, they should be above the politics of local communities and, you know, you scratch my back, you know, in yeah. in any of the dealings with, you know, with the other municipalities, they, right. they're the state police. Right. So, um, a couple times during 90 to, uh, 2000 and something, mm-hmm. we were, we were always asking for updates and, you know, they would have us come in and tell us, you know, some little thing here and there. But uh, it got to be where, oh, it's, it's kind of too old. We have new, no new clues. Um, we've run out all our, uh, what's the word? The Leads, you know, they've investigated. Lead tips come in yes. and, you yes. know, they're doing what they can, they say. And one statement was made a few times. We're just waiting for someone to confess or find the body. That's what we were always hoping for, a confession or find the body. Um, what was – can I ask you now? We know – we're gonna listeners are going to find out what happened in 2012. There's a reason, listeners, we keep bringing that year up. But what did the state police tell you? I mean here you have a guy who was harassing your sister, who had been in a relationship with your sister. She was bringing a lawsuit against him in this police department. He was identified as – being in this tow truck that dropped their car off, is that not enough to, you know, start a, a grand jury or, you know, some district attorney out there didn't say, you know what, this this sounds like a, a winnable case. That that didn't happen. You would think so, wouldn't you? You and would. Actually, the um, Marquez and Romo were uh, supposed to submit the hair and blood sample and a court overturned it because they weren't considered suspects. They're considered, as the wording of the police, persons of interest. POIs, yeah. Since there was no charges filed on them, they couldn't get the blood and hair samples that they needed for comparison. Mm-hmm. Uh, to this day, they still don't have that as far as I know. Okay. Um, and, yeah, with what, what evidence... That I, you know, I'm not even a police officer. I'm mm-hmm. not a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what we have found out in the, especially mm-hmm. starting in the year 2012, mm-hmm. I cannot, for the life of me, figure out why they're not in jail. I, I just, it's beyond me. It's mind boggling. Because and I know my sister's not the only person, as you know, in yeah. your broadcast, yeah, that, that are going through very similar. That's situation. true. That is absolutely true. True. Yeah. In fact, the last show that I just had on with T- Kathy Turkanian, uh, and, you know, and her uh, daughter, her biological daughter that disappeared, it's a similar situation where there's all this evidence and still nothing's been done. Yeah. And the listeners should know, being that, you know, I do so much, you know, internet research for the show, there are several cases. Never think because you don't have a body that somebody can't be convicted of a murder. It's actually, if you start going through, for example, charlieproject.org, you're going to find several cases where that's happened. It's more common than you think. I wouldn't say it's common, but it's more common than you think. So that's what I start thinking when I start thinking about Robin's case. Uh, so, two, so 1990 to 2012, you just think they're doing their job. You're being a mother. You're being a wife. You're raising your sons and just going about your life, just fingers crossed, hoping something ha- good happens. My son and my daughter. Son and daughter. I'm I sorry. Daughter. I apologize. I thought it was two sons, son and daughter. But then what happens in 2012? In 2012, a private investigating lady by the name of Cindy came to my home to present me with now what I call is my Robin file. Mm -hmm. Um, She used to be a police officer. She became a private investigator, and she also um, 
worked in Will County for some of the, the courts in Will County for battered women. She came across my sister's case and thoroughly investigated it. And, uh, mm. What she found is what I've been telling the police mm -hmm. for the last, since 2012, um, mm, of what evidence that we have and how come, why have you not done this? Here's a for instance, Ed. Mm -hmm. um, the people named on her lawsuit were never interviewed to this past year. And when you say her, her lawsuit, you need to be specific here. Robin's lawsuit, they were never named. The people that were on the lawsuit mm -hmm. were never interviewed. Interviewed, okay, never interviewed. Interviewed. I mean, they were never interviewed. The person at one point in time, which we'll get into later, mm -hmm. who we know uh, possibly her first grave site was, mm -hmm. told them, you're not digging here, you're digging 100 yards away, and that's going to be the end of it. They didn't interview that man till last month or the month before. This is over 26 years. Mm -hmm. The man that... This mm -hmm. is mind-boggling to me. I just, I, All I don't right, we, we, we need to line this up for... So why did this uh, private investigator... Did she used to work for Will County? Did she work for Cook County? Did she work for the state police? What, she were, initially worked for Orland Park, which is Cook County. Okay. And then she worked for the um, state's attorney's office in Will County. Mm -hmm. After um, she went through a similar situation, Robin was, and had a lawsuit. And she got out of the department there, and, and then she ended up, you know, as Robin was an advocate for, you know, women and whatnot. And yeah. she came across Robin's case. And it wasn't even dirt that she dug. She just, you know, did mm. did a a job that, you know, you would think that the state police, police. would have done. <laughs> for the last 20 I mean, years. For the 20 years in which you thought that they were yes. doing their job, this woman, exactly. you know, put this together. I mean, how long do you think it took her to put all of that information together for you? Well, it's going to be since 2010, so two mm -hmm. years. Two years. But okay. it wasn't constantly working on Robin's specific case two years. I mean, sure. you put out FOIAs, you have to wait for the FOIAs and, you know. FOIAs, for, voice, the, blah, blah, blah. FOIAs for the listener are Freedom of Information Act requests, FOIAs, if you don't know what that is for the listeners. You mentioned burial site. Tell us about that. How did you find out about in, this? In 1996, a gentleman by the name of Art. Please, you can use his full name. That's fine. Okay, Art Burchett. From Moni, Illinois, got in trouble for having guns and weapons. The police knew him very well. As a matter of fact, Marquez was a good friend of his. Uh, Robin even went out to Marquez, I mean, Burchette's property once to look at car engines because they were um, something about the car and she at that time was dating him. So he went out there and took Robin with her. So mm -hmm. she, she knew who Burchette was. Mr. Burchette got in trouble with the police in Will County. And he says to get out of these charges because he was in a lot of trouble with other things. He says, I know what, uh, I may know where uh, that Deputy Robin Abrams is buried. And he went on to tell them that uh, one night uh, a car drove down his driveway, a black like sedan car. And um, he didn't know what time it was or whatever. It was very vague. But the next day, he went out to dump his grass clippings because he had a very big yard mm -hmm. and he noticed uh, 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 like a grave like an indentation or a grave there mm -hmm. and he says I wouldn't be surprised you know if that's where they you know Robin Abrams is and the reason why that's connected is because Marquez mm -hmm. and him were very good friends yes. and he wanted to get out of trouble and so, did not Burchette sort of have a little bit of a, a mob connection, too? Did you not? All right. Mr. Burchette worked the Messino brothers from the city, um, mm -hmm. Dickie and Clem. One of them has passed away. Um, he was good friends with them. Um, mm -hmm. It's just. And did they not, yet. did the Messinos not also own a tow truck business? Yes, the Messinos owned a tow truck. Business. So we can oh. kind of tie that into Tony Marquez being seen with that tow truck six years earlier, 
you know, in 1990, you know, dropping off Correct. your, we can connect that, we can kind of all tie that in together. But, Correct. so, you, the listeners have to keep in mind that Jody and her family did not find out about all of this information that she's going to be telling you from now on until 2012. So she didn't know this, you did not know this was going on in 1996. Nobody ever told no. you this. No, we, we, we were told in a meeting uh, with James Glasgow, the state's attorney and current mm. state's attorney, uh, something about, did we know Burchette, mm. they asked. Okay. I, I never heard of him. Mm-hmm. And um, about, uh, and we didn't know him. I, I didn't know who he was. My no. parents didn't at that time. No. And then that was the end of it. That was the end of it. And then come to find out in 2012, I got this letter. Um through the lady, Cindy, who mm-hmm. was helping, mm-hmm. um, I ended up putting a billboard up um, on I-80 in Joliet mm-hmm. about my sister with information and that kind of thing that people, you know, do. I only had it up for a month because it was very expensive. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I got help. Um, the I was going to say the very next month, because it was only up a month, a gentleman by the name of Joe Hosey, who works for the Patch, um, he's a reporter mm-hmm. who did several stories on Robin. You can. Um, and what year would this have been? Let's just be clear. What year would this have been? This year would have been 2014. Okay. 2000. Wait, 2013. I put the, the um, billboard up. Yes. And I met the gentleman by the name of Steve, who was actually the very first uh, officer to come to my parents' house back in. Um, October 4th of 1990, right. who took the report of the missing person. Okay. And on January 27th of 2014, uh, he wanted to meet with me. And, and Joe wanted to meet me. Steve, Steve or Joe wanted to meet with you? We just have to clear Steve the pronouns. Steve wanted up. to meet with me. Steve, Steve wanted, wanted to meet okay, with me. St- okay. Steve was a cop I, who was who took the initial report. Okay, from 1990. Correct. Okay, great. Correct. And he... um thought that this was all done and over with because it was taken out of his hands, as you recall, by Mm. the state police. So Mm. he had to give all his paperwork over to them and, you know, whatnot. And um, in Mm. talking to him, I said, I want a letter and I want you to sign and date it because I'm going to hold you to what you're telling me. Mm. And he was also brought before a grand jury in 2014. Nothing's come out of that yet. Okay. But... um, you want me to read to the listeners? Uh, let's just con- let's just condense this down. Let's talk about um, what Steve, what happened out in front of his house, and then how coincidentally he was the person, he was the guy, the cop who showed up to, with the car. And then we can talk about what. Then we can talk about the burial. Okay, so. my sister um, <laughs> had an altercation uh, in front of. At Steve's house back in August of 19, it would have been 1990, 89 or 90, I can't okay. remember. And it was my sister out in the front in her car. She was pulled out of her car, handcuffed, pulled out of her car. He came out, her and her scream. They were beating her head against the car. The people I'm referring to is the two police officers. Tony Marquez, who was an Mm -hmm. auxiliary at the time, Mm -hmm. who, remember, at this time also had an order of protection to stay away from my sister. Yeah. And a gentleman by the name of Phil Fabo, who was his best friend, who also uh, worked for Will County Auxiliary. And then another um, Will County officer by the name of Carol Szynski Mm -hmm. also came in a white unmarked band. And... She says, help me, Steve. He goes, what's going on out here? And um, that's when uh, Mr. Knickram, and in this letter I'm reading his mm, exact words. Steve, Steve. He, he said, he heard Lieutenant Szynski state something to the effect of somebody ought to kill this bitch, regarding, referring mm, to my sister mm-hmm, Robin. Mm-hmm. Um, and coincidentally, so, I mean, what is the, what the coincidence here that... The, the the cop who ends up being the first one on the scene when her car was found, that this happens out in front of his house like months before that. I mean, I that is some crazy coincidence. I believe I absolutely believe it's true, but listeners really need to understand how strange that is. Yes. So, yeah. I um 
And he's the only one that came forward with a mm. bunch of information. I mm. have his letter, yeah. which he also went to the grand jury um, in Joliet. It was a closed grand jury. You don't know what they said, and I have no idea. Mm. But he he also gave me the information of uh, the Messina brother tow truck. It was dropped off in Harvey. He gave me the information about um, when they came to the location and said, um, the gentleman by the name, I'm giving his name, John Moss, the mm-hmm. deputy chief says, you're not digging here. Well, you're digging 100 yards Yeah, let's away. make sure we're clear on that. Being that we mentioned Art Bruchette, he said somebody came to his property, just to go over this because that was a couple minutes ago now. Somebody, it looked like somebody buried something on his property. And right. he told the cops about this. They went out to dig in 1996 or 1997. and 96. And, 96, and this Steve guy was there who was writing this letter, who was the first guy on the scene for her car in 1990, and John Moss would not let the guys dig in the right place. Tell him about right. that. Tell him about that more intricately okay. on that. It was Deputy Moss. He was on the scene already with a female reporter from the Joliet Herald. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the possible location indicated by where Burchette, where Burchette said the grave might be. Mm-hmm. But a... Um, Upon, you know, arriving there, um, they were told, Mr. S- um, Steve and mm-hmm. his other people that came because they got the warrant, mm-hmm. um, we were ordered by Chief Moss to dig in a location where Bruchette indicated was not the grave, but a depression caused by a broken brain tile. We protested that the grave was in an area about 100 feet away, mm-hmm. but by orders of John Moss, says dig there and that's going to be the end of this and that's what happened to that part of it and of course they didn't find anything right right okay and then i'll i'm going to read a little bit further okay after the election was over in 1990 or in 19 in 1990 in 1990 in november fitzgerald was now the new sheriff and Moss was no longer deputy chief, so they executed another search warrant on the property, and, sub- and then subsequent- subsequent- oh, subsequently, subsequently, <laughs> you and I both have, we've, <laughs> yeah, we've had problems with this word before in our conversations before, listeners, yes, you should yeah. know. Subsequently, okay, so this, and we should clear up, this is 1996 that this election happened for Fitzgerald, but subsequently, they... 1990, the election. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, you're correct. I apologize. Okay. It was 96 that the uh, election. Um, no, no, 1996 was when uh, they went to the grave site. Right. In 1990, the election was when Fitzgerald fired um, okay. Tony Marquez from the auxiliary. Okay. And then they go back after Moss was no longer exec- you know, deputy chief right, right. with another search warrant. Okay. And found the grave site... Chet told us, uh, but there was no body. But evidence of a shallow grave depression appeared. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> she might have been there. And They moved her after that first dig. 90, right. Mm-hmm. In 19, just so we're clear, Art Bruchette in 1996 gets caught. While he's talking to police, he tells them, you know, back in 1990, this, this people came onto my property in the middle of the night. I think they buried something there. Right? Right? right. Correct. Right. Yes. And um, so supposedly, um, and to date, now it's 2016, um, we did not know about those areas until 2012. You know, we found out how much of it. Um Right. We have the first female detective on her case. Her name's Anna. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's been a slow process, and it's very hard for a family to put their trust into an entity that for several years <laughs> covered it up. Um, and we had our ups and downs, but I, I'm, I'm praying with all my heart that she is the one that's going to really break this because um, she's working on it very hard. They have gone. Well, we have a second. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. They... Let's talk about the second <laughs> location before we get into that. There was okay. not just this letter from Steve that was signed. You have a letter from a guy who 
is called Joe, although that's not his real name. What, and Correct. we want to, we don't want to use this second property owner's last name. We'll just use his first name. Okay. okay. All right. We'll just say Jeff and we're just going to leave it at that. But Joe told something to the cops. Once again, this is in that time that you thought everything was hunky dory. You know, they were going about their business, but there's this guy, Joe, that also made a statement to police. What did he say? No, actually, I okay. don't mean to, I need to correct you there. Okay. When we had found out, we ended up with a website, Find Robin and Help Find Robin. Mm -hmm. I also got a post office box. Okay. And on February 24th of 2015, I get a letter in the post office box from a gentleman named Joe. Wow. And he said he may know, have the location where Robin might be buried. And he proceeded to tell me the story of his friend by the name of Jeff, who lives in Piatone, Manhattan area, off of mm -hmm. Joliet Road. Mm -hmm. We won't give the exact no, address. No, we're not going to give the exact address. <laughs> but Joe's friend, who lived on the property... Mm -hmm. um, Before Jeff. Had, Before Jeff. Yeah, Joe's friend... Mm -hmm. Jeff. Jeff lives on the property. But um, one day, Joe had a very good police friend who was also named on several of Robin's report by the name of, his last name I'll say is Farmer. He's no longer with us. Okay. He died. And um, do you want me to go into what I want you to tell the story, that. and you just tell the story. That's why you're here. You just tell the story. I'm going to read the last paragraph of okay. Joe's letter. Okay. Because, yeah. Great. Joe had a Will County Sheriff's Sergeant officer friend that died last year, which would have been 2014. Mm-hmm. Who which he didn't want to name, but I already did. Joe was telling him of the problems that his friend was having with the building on his property, harassment from officers. Uh, the gentleman's house was burnt down. The gentleman's house had gunshots fired through it. And his friend um, told him about Officer Sosi. Here's another name. S-O-U-C-I. Um, That's how you spell it. S-O-U-C-I-E. I-E, yes. -E. okay. Um, who had friends that were farming the field of Mr. Of, of, of Jeff. Jeff mm -hmm. bought the property, and for years prior to that, the farmer let the friend of mm -hmm. Sosi farm his land. Yes. And he told Joe that he wouldn't be surprised if Sosie didn't have something to do with the disappearance of the former Will County deputy, Robin Abrams. He said Sosie was a part of that group naming Marquez Corpus, which is another name to remember, mm -hmm. and was a crony with Paul Corpus, which was the Will County Sheriff's Police at that time. He stated that he was not a straight and honest guy. Joe fully believed that his friend was telling the truth regarding, um, you know, the situation with Robin, uh, and that he felt the mm. need to get it off of his chest and because um, it was bothering him. So he passed on the information to me. So mm. we looked up, um, and sure enough, on the Internet, which mm. I really appreciate, you find a lot of information, the gentleman's house <laughs> yeah. was burned it was down. Burned the down. gentleman, his house was shot up. Yeah. And um, the reason why Sosie was vehement to uh, not allowing... Um, Jeff built, he wanted to build, the whole thing that started it was mm -hmm. this barn that he wanted to build in the back of his property. Mm -hmm. And they came up with so much resistance, he couldn't get permits, he couldn't, uh, you know, his house got burned, I don't know if that's all, you know, it yeah. just seems strange to it, me. And yeah, there's a lot of drama regarding just the, the building of one simple building. Correct. And this and is out, you have to understand, this is out in the middle of nowhere, this is not downtown Chicago. This is very rural, yes. very rural uh, farmland, yeah, farmland county area. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. And um, so we have two locations now um, yeah. where they had her from 1990 to 96, where yeah. she was supposedly moved. I got to say, supposedly. Yeah. Um. So these people, I mean, I don't believe that there's people that would. Well, maybe there are. That would come to you and you know give you information on your sister, you know your mm. your dead your murdered sister. Why why would they make them up? You know why would they say, 
you know, and, and, and put these names. I've never heard of these people. I, you know, but then when we start looking into it, Sophie was affiliated with Will County. Um, it all ties in. I mean, even... Um, so let's let's just break this down for the listeners real quick, because there's so many names, so many locations. It's it's a very complex case. I just want to break this yes, down. What Art Bruchette said was he believed that there was something that was buried on his property. The cops went out to dig it up, and Moss would not allow them to dig in the right location, so nothing was found. So the suspicion is sometime after that, before they could go back. Those same people who might have put Robin's body there went there, dug her up, allegedly, and brought her somewhere else. Once again, now we're talking about this second location, okay? Correct. It was buried there with, you know, whoever, the owner, the landowner's permission, or these other people who were farming on the land's permission. But then this Jeff guy, who was a truck driver, comes along. He buys the property. There's this agreement that these other guys can still farm on it. They have some disagreements, and you can find, once again, like you said, you can find that on the internet. But then when Jeff wants to do some things on the property, he's the second. He was not the owner when Robin's body might have been buried there. He was the owner afterwards that he was being harassed, and his house was being shot up. And then in January 8th, and I have the, I think it was January 8th or January 14th, 2014, so that's just a couple years ago, but 24 years after Robin disappeared, his house gets burnt down. Right? That's that's how his that... His house was burnt down on July... Of, or, no, um, January. It was January of 2014. The bizarre thing about this, the listeners should know, and I think you knew this already, is that as of you and I doing this show, November 2016... That house has still not been rebuilt. Correct. Now Correct. you've had a chance. We're not saying Jeff's last name, but you've had a chance to talk to him. What What do you feel comfortable of saying about your conversations with Jeff? I have no reason to disbelieve this gentleman. I like mm-hmm. said I've never met him before. Um, mm-hmm. But the circumstances with, with the Sosi who was, you know neck deep in with Will County. I mean, there was a lot of, there, and there still is a lot of yeah. cover-ups in Will County. And, um, you know, since it started to, for, for what, 22 years, mm-hmm. they got away with it, what they thought. But now, right. you know, I've been getting to do interviews, um, like with Roseanne Teus on CBS 2 News in 2014, mm-hmm. and especially people that you, I'm so Grateful to you for helping us, us families have You're welcome. have a, have a voice because the victims don't or their voice. Um, so stuff started happening after two thousand and um, twelve. Yes, you know, twelve. When I yes. started, I I, I can't um, say that anything did happen between nineteen ninety till then until mm. we started. You know, letting them know, hey, mm. we got a location. We got a location where my sister's possibly at. Go get her. We have a location. We have um, eyewitnesses that put him in the, you know, this and that. everything mm-hmm. that we had, they've had, except the second location, which they do now have. Mr. Mm-hmm. Our state policeman, Leo Schmitz, was in my home in mm-hmm. February of 2014. I mm-hmm. gave him the letter. They all know they had that mm-hmm. letter. They had the letter from Steve from the first location. And Anna has been working diligently. Let's hope that this carries through to, you know, to have um, resolved to have justice for Robin. And I, when I first met Anna, because there's been many, many names and mm. either retired or sent to another location. Once they start getting, you feel comfortable with them. You know, your your voice is hopefully being. No, it, it didn't happen until Anna started, you know, coming into the picture. Yeah. Um, and one of her. Uh, supervisors by I'm going to just say the name Jeff yeah he came to my house in um, January this is a different Jeff this is a Jeff from the uh, state police department Mm -hmm. okay and um, here's the thing I I gave them all this information we went to the FBI I got escorted out of the FBI by two big FBI agents because the wording says missing person Mm -hmm. 
if it was a, uh, a murder, they would help me. But I kept going back, and I finally ended up getting escorted out by the FBI. <laughs> that was a scary thing. But I'm doing this for my sister. Someone yeah. has to speak up for her. And then um, the Jeff from the Illinois State Police and Anna came over, and I was not going to give him or them any more information. I put a folder together, and I wanted him to sign it and date it and say, now you have this information, so you're not going to tell me you never heard it before, you never got it, because that was the runaround we were getting for, yeah. for you know, four years after that, yeah. or two years. Two years. And um, me and that Jeff had a little bit of confrontation. I actually kicked him out of my house. I said, wow. They told me that it was just hearsay. I was going on hearsay. I mean, it's a theory. And I'm thinking to myself, well, wait a minute. Aren't there people that give you information that you're going to go and check on? I mean, this yeah. would have been something you would have gone and checked on and not just, you know, tell me that I'm a lunatic. Is basically, yeah, right, you know, what they were, not her so much, but him. And but It I, only I becomes hearsay if it's in court. I mean, until that point, it's it's a possible lead. And now, Correct. if they follow the lead and doesn't go anywhere, then you just say, well, might have just been a rumor. But you don't know that until you actually look into it. Exactly. And that's what the problem I was having uh, was no one would be good. I actually, Hiram Grau was the prior state police chief, and I was in constant contact with them <coughs> Pardon mm -hmm. me. Um, with one of his, with his, um, his chief of staff there, Eric. And one day I was so mad I got on the phone because no one was listening to me, and I called um and Eric had another gentleman. It was a three-way call. This is the response that a missing person's family got mm -hmm. from the people that were hope that I was hoping was going to help us with our sister. The words out of their mouth, and I made them say it three times. They told me this was right after I kicked Jeff out of my house, and and gave you know they mm -hmm. refused to take the information which they've had. We've given it to the FBI. We've given it to every. You know, they told me if I keep saying what I'm saying and doing what I'm doing, I can go to jail for perjury. Three times I had him tell me that. I mean, you're not under oath. Like, you're not under oath. You can't. Well, I mean, it may be it may be slander or libel, but it's surely not perjury. Well, I I knew that. I mean, and I'm thinking to myself, well, why am I on trial here? I'm not the one that murdered my sister, and you have evidence to go after. You know, to go look. And I told them, really? So that ended the conversation with them. So I, I you know, kind of felt hopeless there, but still clinging to hope and prayer and believing. I am going to get justice for my sister. And I just want to encourage every single case, and you've done a few on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. There's many more. Yes. Never give up. Right. Somebody will come forth. It'll happen. Just please never give up. And what I'm going through, I've also reached out to, um, there's other places besides the police department. And if I could just share this with the uh, listeners, um, for instance, a gentleman by the name of Tad Tobias, D-I-B-I-A-S-E, you can Google him. Mm -hmm. He's a lawyer for no body cases. I contacted and reached out to him, and he said he would love to do this. And here's the problem I ran into. He said, in all his years of doing it, this department, which was the Illinois State Police, was the first department that would not accept his help. Now, to me, that speaks volume. This man could, po with the information we have, not pertaining to the body, because we don't have that yet, mm -hmm. but pertaining to everything that's drawn up to it, this man, th he could be in jail right now, facing what he deserves. Tony Marquez. By the name of Marquez, correct. I reached out to a group called NecroSearch, which is out of California. Those are forensic people. They mm. would do it for free. Wouldn't cost Illinois taxpayers a dime. I reached out to the Vidoc Society, which is out of Pennsylvania. They're retired professionals um, mm -hmm. that take on cold cases. Mm. I reached out to um, another group by the Amer name of American Investigated Society of Cold Cases gentleman by the name of Kenneth Maine. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Henry Lee, but he's the leading um, 
forensic pathologist in the world. He teaches plant. Anybody that's teaches. old enough to remember the O.J. Simpson case surely remembers Dr. Henry Lee. Yeah. Okay. I met with these people back in 2014. I went to their conference, and they want to help. They said they would definitely help. And here's another thing. It wouldn't cost the taxpayers a dime. Mm. But every response back from them was, without the police cooperation, we cannot get involved in the case. And, and Illinois yes. State Police will not give them permission. It's they not, will not give them permission. Not, so here's what we're trying to do. Uh, in, in, re, in regards to um, these people that I mentioned, we're trying to get a law passed mm -hmm. so that people of murdered victims or missing can get their own outside agencies to help and assist with the case, because I, I know 100% in my heart my sister's case would have been done and justice would have been served by now if we had the cooperation. We're trying to get a law passed through um, and, and doing that for all of us. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just for Robin, but it's for all of us, for Molly Young, and, and the names can go on and on. Um, and that's yeah. what we're, we're working on now as we speak. And, you know, just never give up. There, there's going to be justice. There's going to be, hopefully that ray of sunshine will come real soon. I want to yeah, ask you, I want to go back and ask you a little bit about Jeff, the landowner, okay? okay. Like I said, you've talked to him a, a, a couple times. Once again, we're not saying his last name. What is the reason that he's given you that, even though his house was burnt down in January of 2014, that it's still not been built yet. What's the, what's the reasoning there? Did, the holdup is that the, the, the um, township will not give him building. Per, uh, there's a fight between the uh, the town, mm -hmm. the insurance company, and you know the entities that are involved in him to be able to replace his home. Mm -hmm. And those, you know, those circumstances, I'm not real clear on yet. I, I, you know, and just so, and, and just so we're also clear, even though I know we talked about that this last time before we did this interview, we still don't know what the actual cause of that fire is. You know, the fire department hasn't come out. It was an electrical fire, or you know, he left the stove on, or something like that. We don't, we don't know yeah. what the what the reasoning for this fire is yet. No, we do not. I okay, do not and it's all, okay. We we don't know. There's they probably know what it is. It's just not public information. And I can tell you that since you and I talked the last time, I've tried to look into that, and I could not find anything, you know, regarding this. So the the circumstances of that by itself are a little suspicious. Usually, when somebody has their house burnt down, they get it built again, <laughs> you know, within a couple years. So there, there's Correct. that. Um, the other question I'm sure the listeners are going to be wondering is here you know this Jeff who's this landowner. Yes. You have you thought about going onto that property yourself, getting somebody who owns a backhoe or something, and maybe just probing around about possibly where her body might have been buried, even if it's not there anymore. You know, once again, this is just a theory. Well, I did have um, permission, and I did meet with um, Jeff on his property, mm -hmm. and there was a group of ha dog handlers that came out um, okay. with me. Um, in the initial, you know, I don't know how credible they were. They just wanted to help, you know. Um, but here's what I was told. They found nothing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Here's what I was told by the uh, Illinois State Police, because now, yes, yeah, I'm sitting here with two locations. Why didn't I go dig up my sister, correct? I, I, Here's what they told me. Yeah. They told me that if I was involved in that in any way, that it would hinder their defense of, you know, the investigation to where they pick up the court and say, oh, by the way, Jody, you know, Jody, to have any ties in with the finding of my sister would not make an easy job for the, the state police to um, have all the facts. They say that, you know, that people could tamper with it or whatnot. So they advised me not to get, you know, for my own safety also, um, not yeah. to be going over to any, you know, because I've been on both locations, once with uh, the people with the dog and the other one I was on 
just walking around, and I had the permission from the people that were renting it at the time. Now we cannot go on that property because that first property, they said, um, we're not allowed on. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, no no crime scene was, you know, the, the areas were not secure. I mean, yeah. they're not secure to this day. Yeah. And um, uh, other than going to get her myself and have it over with, their reasoning to me seems logical. I don't want to do anything to hinder having justice for my sister. You, you know that. most Everyone knows that they wouldn't want to do that. But I do appreciate you letting our voices for them be heard because mm-hmm. this isn't going to go away, Ed. I'm not stopping until my sister... We need to, Ed. We, we need to... We, we, the thing is, we're getting toward the end of the interview, but we haven't pointed out one of the major things. Uh, tell the listeners about what Tony Marquez's own wife said about him. This was a phone call we received back in January 4th uh, uh, of uh, January 2012 by a gentleman out of the Will County State's Attorney's Office by the name of Dave. He mm-hmm. read to my myself and my husband mm-hmm. the exact statement that Tony Marquez's wife Arlene told them, which the gentleman's name was Ken Coppice, she told to mm-hmm. who was state police, that she knows... What year would you, What Marquez, year did she make this statement? What year? Uh, this was in 1990. 1990, okay. Supposedly 1990, yes. Okay. That she knows Tony killed my sister Robin because Tony told her this. She told the policeman it was in the statement... That statement was read to us. I says, oh, well, then why is uh, he not around? Well, they can't do it because of the law, because if you're married, you can't testify against your wife or you know, <laughs> that's, husband. Okay, that's not how that law works. That. Well, this is, you know, here's the thing, Ed. Yeah. She's not home. She's not missing. She's not on a vacation in Florida. Yeah. She's dead. Right. Yeah. It should right. be changed from missing to murdered, number one. And Tony Marquez should he have the pressure on him? I mean, oh, uh, a few months ago, they went and interviewed him again, the state police, Dan and them. They lawyered up right away. Mm-hmm. So now, you know. Yeah, we should, we, should st- we should say for the record, even though she told the police that she thinks that her husband murdered Robert back in 1990, she's still married to him 26 years later. Correct. That's crazy. That's, a, that's one Correct. unique relationship. Yes. Wow. Wow. And well, so Tony Marquez, what has he been looking. what has Tony Marquez been doing over the last twenty six years? He got fired from being a cop because of yeah. these yeah. Th- this Robin's, you know, what she said about him. What has he done since then? How's he running how's he handled his life? Well, he's been doing pretty good with for himself. He has an insurance company. I don't know if he's retired from that yet, an investment company. He was also actually named Outstanding Hispanic uh, member of the Crest Hill Chamber of Commerce. And when I found that out, I called Crest Hill and I gave him a little information about Mr. Marquez. I bet you did. And they they weren't too happy about, you know, what they have on there. You know, I mean, mm. you know, you murder somebody, you go out and you know, nothing happens to you and you got all your buddies in your pocket. No, there's, there's a similar situation going on like that in America right now. And I'm telling you. We are patriotic. We're not going to put up with that. No. And I'm a sister. I'm a sister of a murdered victim. Yeah. Get how I want. I'm a murder sister. Help me out here, Ed, because I'm getting upset <laughs> when I think about this. You, you know, I you're am a sister you, you, to a murder victim. Yeah, who you has are. Not got justice. No, you was haven't. A police officer, and you know, mm. it's not right. And the answers are right there, and. They need to do their job, which I hope Anna's doing. And what um, you're saying is all these people it. that we've mentioned, we've mentioned the last name of a guy named Moss. We've mentioned the last name of a guy named Susie. We've mentioned some other last names. But you also have a couple women who have been in. This isn't like a good old boys club. This is a good old girls club, too. There's some, been some female police officers who have been a party to all of this as well. Oh, yes. So they can't even stick up for her own their own fellow female cop. They chose to go with these other these these guys. 
and the, the irony of this is one of the ladies, one of the lady officers that pulled a gun to my sister's head mm-hmm. when um, they were arresting her for some trumped-up charge, she had a lawsuit against the very same police that she worked for. And that lawsuit was dropped. I, I guess they paid her off, and uh, either that or she was in fear for her life and just went along with it. My sister would have never done that. She she would have never done that. But one lady, um, yeah, stand right there, we had a gun to her head, knowing what Robin was going through, because she went through it herself, mm-hmm. not to the same extent, obviously, went through it herself. And then to come find out Robin's murdered, and she's never come forward. I hope that's eaten at her conscience. I really now, you've told me that she just continued to be a them. cop. She's retired now, and yes, she just will not yes. say. And she's not the only one. As I remember, there were a couple different female police officers, but one in particular, like you said, that had drawn the gun on your uh, sister, Robin, you know, at one time. But there, there's been a couple female officers who have decided to you know, liar up or just not say anything. And that's, that's disgusting. Well, one of them actually was harassed so bad. Uh, they had to change her name and she's, uh, out of state now in a mental institution because of what they've done to her because of the fear she went through and everything she went through in her life because of them. She's actually cracked. Wow. Uh, Jody, how can people help you? Where can they find you, your website, you know, where you are on Facebook? How can they find you so my listeners can help you out and, you know, maybe we can, uh, you know, make some, you know, shake something up in this case. How can they reach you? How can they I find you? I would love it. We have a couple websites, Find Robin um, on Facebook and Help Find Robin on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, Just Google her name, Robin Abrams, A-B-R-A-M-S. There's many articles on her. I suggest you look at the uh, interview um, back in 2000, I believe, 14 with Roseanne Teus or 12. She Mm -hmm. did a very good um, uh, audio uh, of it. Is that on YouTube or where where is that? Is that on on your website? Uh, You can find that on YouTube or or possibly still on our website because sometimes, you know, they take it down and... uh, Okay. And uh, I ask that you pray, and, and I ask that the people that have circumstances similar to ours, yeah. um, drop us a note in, in there, and there's a bunch of us that um, we actually have little, like, meetings, at, not meetings, but little rallies to remember our our family. One is going to be coming up December 1st for a young lady by the name of April Zane, who back in the 70s from Frankfort, Illinois, which is also Will County, Mm -hmm. um, disappeared as a young lady. And we're going to have a balloon launch. Her sister, um, Sharon Rose, is putting that on. Mm -hmm. And also, you're not alone. There's a lot of us out there. (laughs) There, What's going to be the the, – what's the next marker in this case? Did you not tell me something about – you're going to let the FBI do their work, but if something doesn't happen by March or something, is did you tell me that in our last conversation? What's going yes, on there? Yes, I did. What's, I sure what's, did. what's going on? Tell tell the listeners and uh, about that, and then we'll wrap this up. Okay, we have um, another meeting scheduled with the Illinois State Police, Anna, and the the detectives working on her case. By then, they were supposed. They're supposed to have had interviewed all the people, got their all their ducks in the row, gone to the properties, and have a complete synopsis. By that date, mm-hmm. I had several questions we wanted to answer, wrote it down for them. I'm telling you right now, by that date. What's the date again? What's the date again? It's in, I believe, March. Okay. Uh, March 2017. They, correct. Okay. Sometimes they postpone it. We've been postponed many times. But I'm saying by the next meeting, March or, I mean, yeah, March or May, I forget what they said. Mm-hmm. They said they needed time, even though it's been 26 years. Yeah. And we've got all the key pieces that they needed to. I am going to start a, I will have a press release. I will have names, locations, a port. I will have it all. Mm-hmm. I will even have her handwritten pre-deposition letter that she wrote and her lawyer gave us right before she was to go in to give 
her deposition for our side because she already gave it to the state police side. That after that happened, she disappeared. Yeah. Everything that you would need to know that I know, and then you, the public, we, the public, we can demand them to do their job to arrest this man, to get justice for Robin, and to mm. let them know that these people are somebody's mother, somebody's sister, somebody's uncle, somebody. These are our family members, and we will not be quieted till their justice comes. And that's what we're trying to do with the law to help us do. Um, working on that with Terry Bryant down south with Larry Young for his daughter, Justice for Molly. And I just ask that you guys, okay. we could have a wonderful new year with, with lots of answers and a lot of um, hurt being healed by mm -hmm. doing the right thing and bringing justice to our family. Jody, thank and you for... Jody, thank you for joining me and my listeners on Unfound. Thank you very much, Ed. Jody's interview is now followed by my December 1st, 2020 interview with a former deputy and investigator in Will County, Illinois, Steve Knickram. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound a former sheriff's deputy and lieutenant with Will County in the state of Illinois, Steve Knickram. Steve, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. I'm happy to help. Let's talk uh, a little bit about you first, Steve. Um, where did you grow up? Uh, maybe where did you go to high school? And uh, eventually the question uh, I want to ask you is, uh, what made the decision for you to become a law enforcement officer? Let's all cover all of that first. Uh, I grew up in a little town of Piatone, Illinois, that had about less than a thousand people that I when I was growing up. Uh, I graduated high school there, started doing construction with my father, became a paramedic, um, firefighter in nineteen let's see, nineteen seventy four actually. Okay. And got talked into starting as a part time local police officer in Piatone. And while I was doing the firefighter paramedic stuff and eventually got a chance to go to uh, start with the sheriff's office uh, mm -hmm. in like 1985, I believe is when I was okay. uh, sworn in. Okay. Uh, you say that you got talked into it. Maybe you need to explain that. Uh, you got talked into it. Uh, maybe tell the listeners a little bit about that. Well, I say I had a friend of mine that was uh, worked there also. He was a part-time officer, and he said that he thought I would be very good at it, and uh, – and uh, mm -hmm. it, I, and then I did it. it, and I had fun with it. It was a, a, a I like helping people. So. Okay. Had you ever considered being a police officer before this person brought it up? No, I thought I would be bored. I was offered a position uh, at Will County probably ten years earlier hmm. to, uh, to a friend of mine who was a board member. He says you should take the test. You'll, you'll do fine. I, said, I thought I'd be bored, so I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I guess you ended up being wrong about that because I know that once you became a police officer, you, you retired as one, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, all right. So uh, essentially, maybe around what year did this person say to you, hey, I think you might like being a police officer? Roughly about what year was that? Uh, 1977. 1977. Okay. And in Illinois, maybe, uh, you know, I've not, the listeners know I've not been in law enforcement at all, but what is the process? What was your process to becoming uh, uh, eventually a police officer and then, of course, uh, a deputy in Will County? Maybe tell the listeners a little bit about that process. Initially, with the small time uh, agency, we had to take a 400 hour part time officers class. Um, just to get us familiarized with all the rules, relations, and use of guns and stuff like that. Um, and the deputy sheriff, we went to uh, 10 weeks at the Illinois State Police Academy. Um, that was in 1985. Okay. So for so eight years, so you started in 77 when this uh, person suggested this to you. And so for eight years, it was a combination of uh, education and then being a police officer in this small town, or, or what? 
Yes, exactly. I, we did. Uh, we had, were a small police department at that time too, and we didn't have any assigned investigators. So myself and another guy started investigating the uh, uh, crimes in the uh, local crimes. Nothing, nothing major. Um, rather than relying on the county police or mm -hmm. state police, it was fun. It was interesting. Okay. And what made you the decision for you to then go from there to becoming a, a deputy with uh, Will County? What was the what was the deciding factor? It, the the job was a, a good one. There was a lot of lateral movement. I was interested in investigations, and that seemed to be the direction to go. Mm hmm. Okay. So you made that decision, and uh, in 1985 is where. Uh, is the time when you became a deputy in Will County? Yes. Okay. And you, said, July, and you said you had to get some additional, you said you went to the Illinois uh, uh, State Academy. Was that Did that happen back in 1977, or is that something that happened right before you became a deputy? That happened in uh, July of 1985. All right, so you got I that. Mean, at Okay. And would you say, once again, in your experience, would you say that the way you became a deputy there is pretty much the way pretty much anybody? Uh, of course, this of course this discussion, the reason you're on the program is about Robin Abrams, of course. But the way that you, the path that you took to become a deputy is pretty much the path that everybody takes. Yes. Okay. Um, you have to go through a testing process where they've got a, a physical ability test and uh, written exams and interviews with the Merit Commission members, interviews with uh, their investigators. Um, did you pass the test? Did you put on a list? You should get hired, I hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. what worked for me. Okay. All right. And so you got this education. And so uh, I'm, I've only, think, driven through the state of Illinois. So where you grew up, this this town where you grew up, is it in Will County or is in, is it in some other county? In Illinois, no, it is in Will County. Yes, it's in Will County. All Will right, County is about eighty-four square miles. I think it's the second largest county in in Illinois, uh, short of uh, uh, Cook County. Cook County, where Chicago is. Okay. Yes. All right, and uh, we should uh, the listeners should know that Will County is directly south of Cook County. They they're, they're right next to each other, north and south. Okay, um, so I need, and the listeners kind of know where, um, being that uh, they've either listened to the episode way back in 2016, or of course they're listening to this episode right now, and uh, Jody's interview from 2016 just played, uh, they know that we're going to be talking about a lot of things that went on in Will County. Now, being that you grew up there, um, did you ever hear anything once again, first-hand knowledge about Will County, Sheriff's Department, law enforcement, anything like that before you ever became a deputy in Will County? No, I did not. Okay. All right. So you lived there. Except um, for one thing. Uh, well, when, please, uh, please. Yeah, it, it is an odd one, but it's uh, my father and I were working – Remodeling a bar in, I think it was Riverdale, um, for a guy that owned the bar. And he was, I think he was actually, I found out later, he was monetized, but there was a discussion with them while we were there. And, uh, they were talking about um, the gray alert stuff, and the conversation went around uh, to the point that they were going to start in Will County, but they said they were, would that be a government left if uh, they started in Will County? That's why they did the gray alert stuff in Cook County first. And what, I know what they're talking about. Yeah, why don't you uh, explain a little bit more what that means? Well, the Grayler stuff is they've, they've arrested, uh, oh my gosh, there was an indictment for on judges, state's attorneys, police officers, for all sorts of corruption stuff where the uh, criminal cases were being handled by payoffs um, mm -hmm. tied to the Chicago mobsters. Okay. Um, and that's about all I know about it. Okay. So, I mean, at the time, I didn't know anything about it. It's all right. something I heard was heard. I had heard. We talked about it. And didn't, didn't have any other connection with it until um, mm -hmm. got into investigations and then 
Okay. Maybe more you need more. to use that word again. Are you saying uh, maybe it's just my uh, my ears or something? The graveyard, or what? What, what, did, what word did you use there? You, you the said. Word. Yeah. What is that? Y L O R D. That was the uh, uh, investigation. Uh, Gray Lord. Gray Lord. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now I'm maybe the listeners were like I was Gray Lord. So G R E Y L O R D. What is Gray Lord? What 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 is that name? What is it? It was that's that's the name that the feds gave federal agents gave uh, the investigation with to, that they used uh, indicting judges. Mm-hmm. State attorney's office, attorneys, police officers, you know, mm-hmm. federal corruption um, investigation. Okay, and then this was – so when this person brought it up to you, you had no idea what this was, but they said that uh, they were going to start in Cook County first because if they started in Will County, there wouldn't be anybody left? That's right. Okay, and what – approximately what year uh, was this told to you, approximately? Oh, Lord. Um, I, I honestly don't remember. I was in my 20s. Okay. So I have no idea. Okay, so maybe 1970s, maybe? Early 70s, yes. Oh, all right. Like early 70s. And so when you then decided to become a Will County deputy, uh, did you think back to that? Did that even pop into your head? Did you think? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. All right. Not until one of my. Uh, Crossed my mind a little bit. It was kind of like, what the heck? Uh, a friend of mine who was on the American Commission said that, that uh, told me before, he knew I got hired, and he said, "Don't talk to this person. Don't do any favors to this one. Don't go out for drinks with this one. Stay away from all of them." Wow. I thought, oh, that's all. <laughs> so, okay. And I did. Okay, we and we will certainly come back to that. So something after. So what you're saying is after you became a deputy. Uh, somebody said that to you. Correct. Okay. All right, so you became a deputy, you've already said, in 1985. Uh, when you got hired there, what were your goals? Uh, I, I'm guessing, you know, uh, police officers, like anybody else, they have goals in their career. Maybe they want to become a homicide investigator, maybe commissioner, maybe in a bigger city. What were your goals uh, becoming a deputy in Will County? I was hoping someday I'd be able to get into investigations or traffic investigations. I just, uh, it, it sounds kind of corny, but uh, I, I enjoyed helping people. That's part of the reason I've got, uh, was a volunteer fireman, a paramedic. I was something I enjoyed doing, was helping people. Okay. And so you thought, uh, you know, becoming an investigator, being responsible for actually maybe murders, robberies, Things like that. That's where you want. That's where you wanted to go in that direction. Correct. Okay. And how long does it usually take uh, to become an investigator in, in Will County? I mean, what kind of experience? What does it take to become uh, an investigator there? Same, similar process. Interviews. Um, they look at your uh, the arrests you've made, uh, the the quality of your reports. Uh, your follow-up reports on uh, whatever the case we you got assigned to. Uh, mm-hmm. Most of the time, it went directly from uh, the, the deputy in, in patrol to the investigator, and you never found anything out about it, which is pretty much what happened with me too. I mean, it, uh, okay. I was promoted into investigations. I don't remember the month, but it was like 1994, so it was almost almost 10 years. Okay. Years. And would you say that's pretty common? It does take around 10 years? Is it, being that you retired from there after many years, would you say that's pretty common, that, that time span? Pretty much, unless you've got, unless you've got a political uh, guru, okay. uh, so, so to speak, behind you. Then you get it like in a short period of time, which I did not have. Okay. Which was fine. Okay, so you worked your way, you earned it. Uh, after 9 to 10 years, you did become an investigator. Of course, 1994, this would have been after Robin... Um, disappeared. Uh, maybe if you can in those years, uh, maybe some uh, maybe noteworthy things that that happened. You know, once again, just so the listeners can get to know you uh, a little bit better. Maybe some noteworthy things that happened during your time. You know, with you personally, of course, not including Robin's disappearance. Something maybe that you were involved in uh, in those years, maybe the late 1980s. 
you know, in your law enforcement that beginning of working in Will County? Anything that comes Actually, to mind? Um, in, when investigations, they started out doing, uh, we get signed everything. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I had a knack for being able to work criminal sexual assault cases. Most of them end up being on kids, um, uh, oh. where I could just speak with the kids and make them feel as comfortable as they possibly could and also arrest the suspects and get a confession oh, on wow. that. It was, uh, that was uh, interesting. I worked well with most of my cohorts. I, there was a good bunch of investigators I worked with. One of them was Tom Morrison. We actually worked a case called uh, the, 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 Chris Meyer was the, the victim. Uh, I think eight or nine year old little boy that uh, put the bus uh, murdered. I won't go into details mm -hmm. on it because it's just too gory. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's something that comes to mind uh, from your career early on. Okay. Well, it was in, it was in 19, 1995 or so. Okay, so this was after Robin's disappearance. That's fine. Okay, so you uh, you thought that you uh, did a pretty good job on these, like you said, sexual assault cases, even uh, some murders that could involve um, sexual assault. Yes. Okay. Uh, just to give the listeners an idea, uh, I'm sure most of them don't know, how big is, uh, at least maybe maybe it's different now, but back at the time, late 80s, early 90s, how big was the Will County Sheriff's Department? Well, I think we had, at that time, probably less than 100 deputies. Now it's over, over, well over 400 or more. Wow. Wow, so less than a hundred, man, it went it went up by four times in thirty years. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I worked the midnight shift, we probably only had sometimes there was only three deputies assigned, or four deputies assigned uh, mm -hmm. across the county from the Crete area all the way over to Lake Shannon. So it was a uh, spread thin. <laughs> yeah, well, I I guess so. I mean, a hundred back then and then four hundred now. That that's crazy. And and if you know, if you don't know, that's perfectly fine. What is the breakdown between, for example, sheriff's deputies and uh, investigators, et cetera? Or is it just one just one big group? No, there's I, – right, when I was in there, we had – I think we had 14 investigators. And okay. they pretty much had us work specific areas, but it wasn't always – it didn't end up continuing that way. They – Found out that uh, some of us had specific knacks and mm -hmm. did a little better job with uh, certain crimes, and others were just basically report takers. But uh, uh, they were all good, though. I mean, I I didn't have any problem with it, and they uh, did a good job. Now they've got some excellent people, also. Okay. But uh, I, I don't know how many. I don't know that they've got 20 investigators yet. I'm not even sure because it, it's. I did all look like they're about 12 years old to me, so. <laughs> right. So you were there, though. I mean, you were there in 85 when it was under 100, and then when you retired, I guess, sometime in the 2000s, you had seen that department greatly expand. Greatly. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It went from three or four shifts on a midnight shift now to where they've got probably um, 18 to 20 cars out there on a midnight shift now. So. Wow. That's a huge difference. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. All right, now we'll go back to something, back to what this person said to you after you got hired. He said, um, you know, you need to stay away from this person, you need to stay away from that person. We're not going to get into those names, but uh, what did you think, being that you were already hired there, what did you think when this person told you that? I was like, wow. <laughs> and it brought to mind the conversation that we heard at the bar in uh, Riverdale with my father. It's mm -hmm. like, Way you, many years ago, yeah. Um, if you can remember, I know this once again, 35 years ago, but do you remember if this occurred like a month after you started, six months after you started? No, it was like a, a couple of days before I went to the academy. A couple of days before you went to the academy. I, I'm guessing you were thinking, well, what the heck am I getting myself into here? Yeah, actually, before the first year was over, I was like, what in the hell do I want to be a cop for anyway? It was just like, oh, my. It, it, was, it was interesting. Okay. And it was, you know, I kept my nose out of stuff and mm -hmm. steer clear and it didn't help. <laughs> okay, well let's 
let's just talk about that. And once again, uh, as you and I have talked about, and the listeners should know, I've talked to Steve several times before we're um, conducting this interview, which is being done on December 1st, 2020. What we want to try to avoid in this interview is um, we're going to, of course, talk about some names, but I don't think we want to snow, what I would say snow blind the listeners with some na- you know with all the names that you've said over time. I don't think everybody could keep them straight. In fact, I will admit I have a hard time keeping many of them straight. But I, I would not ask you to say this person what names he gave you. But um, in that first year, you already said you know you were already thinking about this. Maybe you can speak about some of your experiences in that first year that kind of backed up what this guy had told you before you went to the academy. Just some, for instance, and you do not have to use any names, but just some examples. Well, the uh, sheriff who I was hired under was one of the names, okay. and uh, they started an investigation on me when I was uh, a couple of months before I finished my first year, which is my probationary uh, period. Um, when I heard about it, I thought it was funny when I went in for my administrative interview, and I, I, I was thought it was hilarious because it was all a, a BS, basically. The uh, gentleman that told me about the people not to hang around with and cause problems, you know, get, get involved with, called me on the phone and said, I know you got an interview with the sheriff tomorrow, bring an attorney. I'm going, well, I don't need an attorney. I didn't, haven't done anything. He says, you need to have bring an attorney with you. So I did. Um, it was uh, eye-opening. We later found out to because we thought something was going on our our phones. It was the three of us uh, involved in this. Yeah, well, we don't want to get. I don't want to get into that right at this second, Steve. But that's that's fine. Um, but what I'm asking you, what? So they wanted to bring you in. Was this something that everybody had to do? You said they wanted to come in for no. this probationary period, or was it just you? It was just me. And now they, that you they brought me in because please of an eavesdropping situation. Okay, and what do you think it was that made you different than all of these other people who did not have this happen to them? Any idea? The only thing I know for sure is that I knew the sheriff had uh, eavesdropping tapes that were recorded at our substation uh, and uh, personal residences of uh, three or four people, and he did nothing about it. Uh, I think it was a a ploy to keep me to shut up, basically, and it worked. So do you, um, when you say eavesdropping, uh, how did you find out that they were eavesdropping on you? We we kept hearing uh, clicking noises on the phones. It was unusual. It wasn't going on before. So I filed a complaint with, uh, investigative complaint with LWL telephone at the time, and it came back down. It came as a founded incident, a discovered that uh, one of their employees was friends with somebody and had them eavesdrop on our phones for personal reasons. When you say friends with somebody, do you mean friends with somebody who in the Will County Sheriff's Department? She was an auxiliary. She was an auxiliary. Okay. Uh, and she worked for IBT, and she was also an auxiliary deputy and a part-time officer in another local town. Okay. Can you think of any reason? So would you say that the these eavesdropping that they were doing on your phones was illegal? Of course, we know eavesdropping on phones can be legal if you get a court order or something. These eavesdropping no, totally illegal. were illegal. Correct. Okay. Why do you think yeah. that, once again, why do you think they, they picked you out? It was directed towards one of the uh, female um, – Dispatchers who her husband thought she was having an affair with me, which she was not. Huh. Um, but they, they, you know, the person was a vindictive, excuse me, a vindictive person. He uh, recorded all the conversations in and out of the substation, like say, uh, out of our phones. And we thought it was funny because we were making up stuff to, because it was so stupid. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, with that, he had the tapes, which made him complicit in the eavesdropping thing because there was no court order for it and no uh, probable cause at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, he been guilty of 
the crime of the traffic also. That's the only thing I can figure out. And if you could say, please, the way you understand it, once again, who is this person who instigated this, to your knowledge? Oh, this, that would have been, uh, I can't remember his first name, Wazalewski? That was his last Wazalewski. name. Correct. All right, and he thought that uh, you and what, a woman that he was involved with were having an affair or something? Please go through that again if you yes. could. Yes. Yeah, that's what he thought. Okay, and he was wrong. That is 100% untrue. That is 100% untrue. Okay, and so he somehow had a connection uh, with an auxiliary officer, and we'll get into the auxiliary thing here eventually. But um, so this person just happened to be an auxiliary officer and work at the phone company, and this person facilitated the tapping of your phone illegally. Correct. All right. Uh, how long did this uh, go on, this tapping of your phone, to your I, knowledge? I, I honestly don't know. You don't um, know? I don't remember. I know it was uh, a couple of months, and it, to, to me it was comical until uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. until it wasn't. Okay. So. All right, and um, so you get called in right before your uh, probationary period over, is over, and this is really very similar to what happened to Robin about her probationary period so you got called in there and but obviously you did not get fired or anything of course you retired from the department but right. you know what was the experience then being that they were tapping your phones and you go in there for this in this uh, meeting or whatever it was maybe you can talk a little bit about that it was basically a meeting where my attorney uh, went in and talked to the sheriff um, they were trying to give me a 30-day suspension, and I said, for what? <laughs> and I said, I haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. My attorney told me that the sheriff would not say what the suspension was for, but because I um, was a day short of my probation period, he could fire me. And but what bottom line was, I had to admit to the charges, whatever they were, or they were going to fire myself and the other two dispatchers. They, and I said, well, I'm not lying about something I didn't do or mm -hmm. just not going to happen. And it boiled down to, I would take a 10-day suspension, and I had to agree to the terms my attorney agreed to was the only thing I could say to the sheriff. Um, never, ever found out entirely what it was about. I just assumed it was because of the eavesdropping thing. So why are you I, I got asked and I said listeners should probably why are you the one who's getting threatened with your job when they were the ones that were doing the the illegal stuff? In addition, uh your lawyer's sitting there, he you of course have told him about how your lines have been tapped. Why isn't he doing anything about this? That uh, it, That that I never found out about. All I know is that uh the tapes were given to the sheriff. That that I was aware of because uh Wisniewski told me that he went to the sheriff because he was trying to get me fired. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't do anything to get fired. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, they gave me a suspension. Take my pay. <laughs> well, days, I, I guess what I'm asking, Steve, is uh, how you, I, I suppose you could have allowed yourself to be fired and then maybe you could have done what Robin did, you know, sued them for illegal termination, uh, e et cetera. But I, I once again have to wonder, you had a lawyer. Why didn't the lawyer say, well, I guess we'll see you in court, being that my my client didn't do anything wrong? Why? I'm just trying to understand because that as best be, as I can. Because my attorney told me that I'd be without pay for two years, which I could not afford. Mm -hmm. I had okay. uh, children, you know, so it's just like I okay. took the high road just to save myself financially and uh, move forward. Okay, so in a way – the sheriff's department extorted you. Oh, yeah. They absolutely. extorted you. Do this or else. Then they knew that they yep. had you between a rock and a hard place. Yep. Okay. All right. And so this was Nooski. Um, he's one of the guys that you mentioned. And who was the sheriff at the time? Um, let's see. Uh, John Shelley. John Shelley. He's dead now. Okay. All right, so we have Wisniewski, we have John Shelley, they're behind this, and I, I guess your your attorney recommended, well, just take those days and, you know, 
you're just going to have to live with it, and then you'll get to be a police officer because the alternative is being tied up in court, you being fired, no income, et cetera. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you for explaining that. All right. Now let's move on to this. Once again, within that first year, um, you discovered that this guy who told you to watch out for these guys um, was absolutely true. Now, actually, on duty, when you're out there in your patrol car, you know, pulling people over, doing whatever your job entailed, did you have a chance to work uh, side by side with any of those guys that were mentioned to you very early on? No, I did not. They were all uh, uh, bosses at that time, either deputy chiefs or lieutenants. Um, I did not. Okay. So these were not uh, entry-level, I guess that's the word I would use as a layman, entry-level deputies. These were all guys that were in, I guess what you would say, supervisors, positions of power within the department in Will County. Correct. Okay. All right. So we have this going on. And when you did come back from the suspension, would you say that, uh, to put it in a way, would you say that bygones, let bygones be bygones, that you know, you just had to keep doing your job because would you say that they forgot about this incident or would you say that what I would call harassment of you continued? Well, it, it went a different direction because one of the guys that uh, uh, they interviewed, I worked with uh, in Eastern Will County, and it was a joke going around because he would be basically uh, the fat guy sitting in the couch at the local fire department asleep by uh, 11, 15 at night when he was supposed to be working because we worked 11 to 7 shit. And we joked about that. Is that who's this fat man sleeping? We should have a contest. Who's this fat man sleeping in the University Park? And uh, take pictures before and after when you wake up surprised. It's just, just a joke. So keep on up. We talked about it and went to one of my supervisors on the midnight, uh, who was Carl Szynski. Uh He was a lieutenant and they were friends. And that's when the I got uh, banned to what they call the I won't say what we call it, but it was the punishment zone. It was out in the other end of the county in Wil Wilmington, where nothing went on. Mm hmm. All right. So even after you came back, there were still things that were going on with you. Oh, absolutely. Yes. All right. So even we though you, uh, I did one one of my lieutenants had helped me out when I was uh, going through the suspension, where they only took uh, one day away for every two weeks that I worked. So I was off without so pay for one day, so it kind of spread it out. It didn't, financially didn't kill me as bad as it would have been off 10 days straight. Okay. But I guess what I'm saying is you took one for the team, even though you knew that they were doing things illegally, but even after you came back, although they might not have been tapping your phones, there were still other things going on with you. Absolutely. Okay. Do you know of any other, of course, we know about Robin, who didn't get hired in, you know, until 88, but any other, and of course, we believe it had more something to do with her gender and, and not with her job, but any other male police officers like yourself going through the same crap you were going through? Not specifically, no. Okay. All right. Let's move on uh, to this. So you saw this click. They're mostly supervisors. Um, like you said, uh, let's just talk about him right now. Did you ever have a chance to work with Tony Marquez, who was uh, an auxiliary police officer? Maybe we need to do that first. Let's ex first explain what an auxiliary, being that you've already mentioned it a couple times already. I want to make sure that the listeners understand what is an auxiliary police officer and what does it mean in Will County, Illinois? In, in the uh, auxiliary police officers were allowed to uh, get in a squad car two of them at a time and back up into regular patrol officers. Uh, they were not trained. They were trained with their handguns, just like every one of the other deputies were. Um, they didn't do any reports. Um, they just backed us up. Okay. And uh, like uh, they were volunteers? Yes. Once again, they were volunteers? Yes, they were volunteer. Okay. And um, so, but, uh, you know, I know that uh, police officers have, a, 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 for example, if they were to do something wrong, would they get uh, a, a lawyer hired by Will County's law firm to, to defend them? How, uh, I mean, how in-depth were they, even though they were just volunteers? 
you know, I I do not know that. Okay. Uh, I do know of an incident where, well, it was Tony Marquez. I'm not sure who the other officer was at this point. Uh, I, I would say the name, but it's I would, could be wrong. And I wouldn't want to sell you somebody else's uh, reputation with that. But um, they, they backed me up on a domestic in the Wilmington area, which is actually was not a domestic battery. Their uh, husband and wife were just fighting, or boyfriend and girlfriend, I'm not sure at this point, uh, arguing. Mm-hmm. Um, we get there, the guy's outside, get him calmed down. Marquez and the other officer were watching him. I went in and take information from the lady to make sure she was okay. Uh, heard a commotion going on outside, and these guys beat the crap out of uh, the guy because he told him to go F off, mm-hmm. and they broke his leg or his ankle. Wow. And nothing happened to them. Okay. I refused to arrest called my lieutenant, which was Lieutenant Carl Szynski again, uh, or then, um, and told him, Lieutenant, I am not arresting this guy. He did nothing wrong. They attacked him, so they took him to jail. Huh. And I don't know the outcome, don't know that, but I know that they did not get disciplined for that. Okay. And was well, the way you remember it, was Tony Marquez one of those people? Yes, he was. All right, he was in that group that beat this guy up, and you saw that firsthand? Yes. Okay. Um, it, what it, would – you're going to maybe have to – Explain this to what was a mar- what was an auxiliary police officer doing at a particular call like that? Backing me up on a domestic. Backing you up. Okay. Now we have to understand that all these auxiliary uh, officers. How many would you say were in there at the time? Just best guess. I, you know, I have no clue. I mean, they they were probably twenty or five or thirty auxiliary officers. The the only ones I ever worked around was Marquez and. Um, a couple of the other ones. I, I can't remember the names all, except for Marquez. He's the one that sticks out okay. because of the problems I've had with him. Right. Okay. So but the, what we are establishing here is they were volunteers, so um, they had other jobs, and they would do this, I guess what you would say, on the side. Yes. All right. For example, Tony Marquez, we've already talked about him with Jody. Uh, he was in insurance and maybe in, still in insurance today. So he's in insurance. Uh, agent maybe at the time back in the 80s, I don't know, something in insurance. But then uh, when he's not doing that, he would volunteer for the police department or the sheriff's department in Will County. Correct. I mean, they did uh, traffic details. They worked the Will County Fair uh, as security at the gates, um, things like that. Okay. Um, did you – how well would you say you got to know Tony Marquez – uh, of course, we now know that he got fired in 1990 after Robin disappeared. But how well would you say you got to know him? Not very. I mean, he was always around. Um, but the only incident I really had with him remarkable until the things with I found out about uh, Robin mm-hmm. was the domestic he backed me up on. Okay. All right. So um, that was the, uh, the extent of it. Um, had you ever heard anything? Uh, I'll just ask you this. When this guy, once again, back in 1985, warned you about certain people within the department, was Tony Marquez one of the people he named? No, he was not. Okay. All right. So he was not. Um, do you know how uh, long Tony Marquez was a uh, an auxiliary uh, deputy there? Was he there before you started, or do you think that he became a volunteer after you started? I think he was there before I started. All right. So by the time 1990 came around, he was uh, um, uh, been there at least five years. Okay. Uh, would you say that Tony Marquez was kind of uh, in with this clique that you've already noted? I, I, in the past, I've heard that. Yes. Okay, but but it was, was I guess I'm just asking you about your impression in the late 1980s. I know you didn't hardly work with them all. Just this one incident. Did you, being that you had problems with these other supervisors, uh, do you think that Tony Marquez was one of their uh, special guys? I guess you might say. Well, the only person that comes to mind would be Carl Szynski because he was the lieutenant uh, in charge of the, uh, at least as I understand it, of, of the auxiliary department. Mm-hmm. He would uh, do the training, uh, up there. 
um, schedules for the special events they work and that kind of stuff. And he was the lieutenant that uh, made the arrest or authorized the arrest of that individual in the domestic that uh, where Tony and the other officer beat the crap out of him. Okay. All right, so uh, we have these things going on. You saw this one incident where they broke this guy's uh, ankle or, or leg because they were beating him up um, due to this uh, this um, call that you were on. Um, once again, I, I, I can only ask you about other things that you personally observed. Um, anything else that comes to mind that is like that where these guys who we've already talked about so far – went a little too far with other things. We'll get to Robin in a moment. That's our next thing on the agenda. But anything else, any other stories like that? Not specifically, but uh, I, I had another incident with uh, Lieutenant Szynski where um, I found out afterwards that, uh, well, he made, he made the comment to the dispatchers on the midnight shift when I was working in the Wilmington area. They sent me on a domestic. And he uh, told the dispatchers not to send me a backup. Um, huh. And I found that out after the case. Uh, I you know, went to the domestic. Uh, I'm sitting down the road, but luckily for me, he, um, we were ordered not to go up to a, a domestic. It was one of our general orders. With right. Our, our standard orders, basically. Of course. With a backup. And right. he ordered me not to have a backup. Do not dispatch a backup. But Luckily for me, I had a good relationship with the Braywood Police Department at the time, and the guy was there within seconds after I heard me being dispatched because they were dispatched by the county also. Wow. But, and you didn't find this out until afterwards? What's that? You didn't find that out until afterwards that he said not to send oh, any no, backup for it? No, wow. I did not. I, I got to the point where I was uh, standing there watching this guy slam – his wife off the cabinets in the in the uh, mobile home they live were in, and I, I told Connie I have to go in. Backup's mm -hmm. not here, and then I heard the Braywood officer say I'm about a block and a half or two blocks away. So I went in, knocked on the door, and got them split up. But um, yeah. then I found out afterwards. Okay. During those, once again, this is the, I just wanted to keep this to the time before Robin disappeared in, in 1990. At any time uh, during that time, did you ever think, you know what, maybe I need to transfer out of this department to another county? I realized, of course, they had threatened to you know, fire you and everything else, but of course you could have always transferred out of there. Did that ever cross your mind at any point? Yeah, it was, it was a thought process, but I enjoyed the job. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy the stress of the job and uh, – uh, the uh, the <laughs> absolutely uh, bad uh, treatment for no reason. Mm -hmm. I actually went to that lieutenant and uh, to tell him, I said, you know, I, I know what this is about, which is the the idea that he thought I was uh, putting stress on his friend over pictures that didn't exist. And when I went in to try to talk to the lieutenant on the midnight shift, uh, I came in and asked him if I could talk to him about this and I, to you know, I just and I made a mistake of saying, uh, you don't need to stress. I, I don't need to stress, and you don't need to stress with this misunderstanding. And he got up and took a swing at me, and I'm like, whoa, okay. Huh. And he told me to get the f out of his office. And I was like, oh, that's not gonna list. <laughs> and I, so I showed up at the door and told him, I do not have pictures of your friend sleeping in University Park. That was just a joke. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, this goes back to what you were so, saying about uh, this one guy who wasn't, you know, just sleeping on the job and, and you saw that and they didn't want to know about it. They took it. You were just reporting on this, what you saw, and you were the one that got in trouble, not this other guy. Correct. And I, and I didn't, uh, we, we didn't tell any supervisors. We, mm. we were joking about it with the dispatchers and another deputy in mm -hmm. our substation. That it would, be, it would just be, just as a comical thing, we would, I would never do that. Thing. That's not, not my, uh, you know, if he gets caught, if he got caught sleeping on his own, he did enough stuff to uh, get himself in trouble by not doing jobs and reports he was supposed to do. Uh, he, he, I think that's not me. Uh, I'm not the tattletale kind of person I ever was. So, okay. But uh, and that's what I was trying to do. So with the lieutenant to say, this is not my business. He does what he wants to do. That's 
you know, if I saw something egregious, yeah, I would say something, but I, I did not. Okay. Now, in this, once again, before Robin disappeared, would you say, now looking back on it, you're retired now, you, you, of course, at the time, you'd only had a few years working in Will County, but you eventually worked there for a very long time. The way you look back at that time now, do you think that these were just people who were a little drunk with power, or do you think that they were really just bad human beings, whether they were police officers or any other profession? I think they were just had were had the power and took care of the people that were friends of them. That's that's All right. the way it was all the time. Okay. Would you use the word corrupt? I'm not I'm not I'm not here. I, I'm just asking the question. I'm not saying you have to say anything. I'm just saying would you have used the word if I had we'd have been introduced in nineteen eighty nine, somewhere I'd have been nineteen years old. But if we'd run into each other and you told me all this, and if I would have asked you, do you think these people are corrupt? Would you? Do you think you would have said yes or no? I don't think I would have used the word corrupt because I didn't know anything about, except for the part with the breaking the guy's leg and taking yeah. the jail. That was right. corrupt. That was wrong. Okay. But I didn't know anything else that was uh, of the nature uh, with Robin. I, I, I didn't even know her at that time. So. Okay. All right, and, and we I heard some things later, but not not of that nature. It was, uh... Okay. All right, so let's be and you brought Robin up. That's a great segue uh, into this. So you're having your problems, but you like the job. You're helping people out. It sounds to me like um, there were just certain people you had to avoid, and you had a supervisor who obviously did not like you too much. But like you said, you just had to keep your uh, eyes down. You know, just focused on the 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 job that you were supposed to do because as we know in a police officer if you don't that's the way you know police officers possibly could get killed if they're not you know concentrating on what they're doing um, so correct I, I totally get it you can't be getting into all the politics and everything else that's going on uh, because you're out there essentially by yourself okay let's talk about uh, Robin do you remember the first time you met her oh. I don't know any dates on it, but uh, mm -hmm. I met her. She was living in, I think it was Crest Hill, and we used to have to drop our squads for service and stuff like that. And I, I, I picked her up from the lower road station and took her home a couple different times uh, over maybe a year or something like that, or six, seven months. Okay. Uh, we were actually also sharing squad cars for a while, too. So I was working midnight shift. I believe she was working afternoons. Okay. We worked side by side. Around. Okay, and so you met her, you had you gave her a couple rides home and everything. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, her personality, um, you know, being that you were four years into the job, let's just say, from 1985, let's just pretend it's 1989, and you're interacting with her. Did you think that she was, um, you know, cut out for it? Did you think she had a good outlook? Did she look like she was uh, enjoying her time, becoming a, a deputy? What do you remember about any of that? I remember she seemed intelligent, um, seemed to enjoy the job, just in the conversations. I don't remember anything specific, but um, she didn't seem to, how would you put it, she wasn't a mousy type person. At least it didn't appear that way. You know, that she seemed like she was comfortable in the uniform, and I never heard anything bad as far as uh, her work ethics or anything mm -hmm. else so, at that point. Okay. When you would give her these rides home or, or whatever, did she ever say anything to you? Well, being that you, of course, at that point, you'd already had your phone tapped and, you know, and these other things uh, going on. Uh, did she ever say to you anything about any harassment or anything that she was getting? No, she did not. Okay. So you thought that the impression she gave you was that things were going smoothly in this probationary period that she was on? Okay. How many, if you can remember, I realized that there were around 100 um, police officers, deputies at the time. How many of them were women? Oh, boy. Let's see. I can remember my one of my training officers for a short stint with a person I met. I didn't work her out with Linda Ball. So it's one, two, uh, maybe a dozen. Okay. Um Gail Chaus was a, a lieutenant um, in the box. Uh, 
Yeah, there was maybe a dozen. All right, so 12% roughly. Okay. I don't know if that was a. I don't know if that's a big number for back then or not. Of course, we know uh, many more women are police officers now than they were in the 1980s. But 12 percent sounds like a quite a bit for the 1980s. Yeah, like I say, we uh, had one out east. There was. There might not even been a dozen. I'm okay. trying to think of it. Okay, that's fine. So what you're saying, there was at least a handful, at least seven or eight. Yes. She was. Robin was not like by herself. There were other women there. Okay. Uh, okay. In any of these conversations that you had with Robin, once again, firsthand conversations with her, however many times, I, if it was just twice you talked to her or ten times, did Tony Marquez's name ever come up? No. Okay. All right. So, uh, I, but we do need to establish some things, being that they are, it's now well-known knowledge that's been known, I think, for 30 years, but I do have to ask you this. In the period of 1980, being that uh, you knew Robin, you ran into her once in a while. Although with Tony, it's not you. Like you said, you only had at least um, one incident with him that you've already described. Did you know that they were in a relationship in 1989 into 1990? Did you know that? No, I did not. Okay. Do you think that anybody else, once again, maybe not at the time, but now looking back at it now, do you believe that other people knew that they were in a relationship? I'm sure they did. Okay, so, all right, especially if they were friends with Tony, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, did you know that, uh, was it, I guess it was, was it well known that Tony Marquez was married? I did not know he was married until after uh, yeah. the probably 19. I don't even know. My mom was in investigations. I, I ran through some things and heard some things, and I'm like, hmm. Okay. <laughs> that's not good. All right. So you weren't sure. I think that's kind of understandable, being that you only maybe worked with Tony once. You didn't ever have a chance to talk about family life or, or anything like that. If you had any kids or anything, but. Robin, of course, claimed that she did not know that Tony was married. I'm not calling Robin a liar or anything else, but do you think that that is conceivable? Yes, it is conceivable. Okay. All right. So, I mean, um, at that, uh, please. At the time, uh, being a police officer, uh, there was deputies that were it was rumored that they were basically – they were married. They were uh, supposedly out running around on their wives. I mean, that's uh, mm -hmm. kind of common now. But um, I did not know Marquez was married. I didn't have that much contact with him ever because I didn't socialize with uh, okay. uh, that group. So to speak. Okay. I'm just wondering, um, you know, once again, I've never been a police officer, but I do know that sometimes, you know, police officers, uh, you know, maybe they get together – for Christmas, a Christmas party, or they have a softball league, or anything like that. Was that not something that Will County did, where officers would get to, you know, co-mingle and things like that, or was that not something that happened, or, or what? Yeah, they, that, that did happen. Uh, every once in a while, we would have the guys out east would go to somebody's house for a, a like a summer barbecue or something like that. And on the midnight shift, we had. Uh, uh, when guys were close up to the central zone and we had enough people, they would, uh, somebody that was off duty would bring a barbecue pit out or a grill mm -hmm. out and make hamburgers and hot dogs and stuff like that. So you know, for, so everybody would come in and have lunch and that, that kind of stuff went on. But, okay. um, as far as going to the bars and stuff like that, I, I just shouldn't do that. Okay. All right. So there might have been some occasions where you know other people would know that Tony um, was married and I think had children at the time, but it doesn't seem that it might have been enough of them where Robin could have had the opportunity to know that unless somebody you know told her about that, which is still uh, I have to admit a little bit of a question mark in my mind, being that they did you know were together for a while, uh, and I guess behind the scenes, even though once again Tony was certainly married at the time. Okay. Let's move on to this. Being that you did get to know Robin at least a little bit, we're not saying you were best friends or saw each other every day or anything like that, but you kind of did know her. Of course, you knew her to see her. She knew you to see you. She knew your name. Uh, let's move on to this. Once again, we're trying to stick to things that you personally experienced. Let's talk 
about something that Jody talked about in her interview, uh, the incident that happened right in front of your house. What year was it? What do you remember about it? Ooh, I think it was probably 1988 or 89. I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, I know it was during the Bull County Fair, which is held in like the end of August, like the 23rd, 24th, 25th, like that. Um, mm-hmm. For some reason, I was actually awake that time during the middle of the day, and I saw squad cars out in front of my house on Corning Road, and walked off to see what was going on because I realized there were county squads, and uh, they had stopped. Well, it was obviously, I knew it was Robin's car. I saw her being manhandled by Tony Marquez. I don't know who the other officer was mm-hmm. again. And uh, she starts yelling to me, you know, Steve, help, help. And I came up, and actually Carl Szczynski was there, two Lieutenant Szczynski. And um, they put her in a squad car, and I, I asked him, I said, you need a phone? Because at that time we didn't have cell phones or any of that. Yeah. Uh, and he muttered the comment, uh, somebody ought to kill that bitch. And, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, did you... So when you were observing this, how far would this have been from your front porch? 35 feet. feet. Very close. Wow. I walked out into the yard to, to see what was going on, and I realized it was Robin. Mm-hmm. And they kind of calmed me up. They were tussling with her in the uh, handcuffs and threw her in their squad car. And they walked up to Did... Lieutenant Suzuki. He needed to use the phone. He said, no, we got this under control. So I went back and asked. You didn't ask them what did she do? I mean, you knew at that point. You knew Robin. Obviously, she knew you. That's why she was saying your name. Um, did you not ask, you know, why are you throwing this auxiliary deputy, or not auxiliary, but probationary deputy, why are you ro- throwing Deputy Abrams in your car? What did she do? You didn't ask? I, I did ask. And I, I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure if it was uh, Carl Szczynski. It uh, probably was him because that they were... Uh, in the process of stuffing her in the car. Uh, the, the, she did criminal damage to uh, Tony's car. I think they said broken antenna or something off of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know if that's fact. Uh, it's probably not, but uh, that, I'm just wondering what they said to you. That's what that's, that's what my that's concern is. Said. Yeah, that's, that's the only thing that was said. Okay. Um, was this the first time in your experience, that you saw Robin having any problems with any of the fellow deputies or or supervisors in Will County. Was that the first time? Yes. Okay. Was that the only time? That was the only time that I remember. I mean, I heard okay. about things afterwards. Right. I'm just uh, a- I'm just asking about what you personally saw. That's all. I, I know you probably heard quite a bit. I'm just asking you what you observed. That's all I observed, yes. Okay. All right, so that happens. Uh, I need to ask you, being that you think this was August of one of those years, being that we know that she disappeared in October of 1990, do you believe this could have been August of 1990, so roughly two months before she went missing, or do you believe it was longer than that? Before I honestly do not know. The, the records, the, the rest records should show that. Okay. I'm sure that Jody had that someplace. Okay. She was put in handcuffs. I'm pretty sure she was arrested. She was in her street clothes. So. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. So you observe this, and, it, and once again, it's just a complete coincidence that it happened out in front of your house. And I, I believe that. I'm not questioning that, but we just have no, to understand it was it just is. a weird, quicky dink coincidence that it happened right out in front of your house. Yeah. The, the exit for these um, fairgrounds, or one of the exits for the fairgrounds, uh, is probably less than a mile from my house. And if somebody was – actually, if she was left to exit on Wilmington Road, she would have gone to uh, uh, was in Ratchy Road, and that's how she would have got out towards uh, – to head towards Beecher would be down Corning where my house was at. So it okay. just was a coincidence, total coincidence. Uh, okay. And once again, who were the people – who um, pulled her over that day. You were, of course, just an observer. You were not on duty. Who were the deputies or supervisors that were there? You saw Tony Marquez. Who else was there? 
I honestly don't know who what the other deputies or uh, auxiliary was named for sure. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably would be in that report as far as the uh, arrest report for that day. And the squad car was behind her red vehicle, mm -hmm. and Carlson's was unmarked um, car was her van was in front of her vehicle. Okay, and and uh, how many officers total were there? Three. Three. Okay. Um, and they said that uh, what they said is she broke off Tony's uh, antenna. Did you uh, did you believe that? I didn't have enough knowledge to believe it or not. It seemed yeah. odd that they uh, wouldn't be trying to arrest her if she did. But I don't know enough about any of the circumstances right. to make a determination of that. Right. And and we have to remember at that point you did not know that Tony was having an affair with Robin. No, I did you, not. To, you, to your knowledge at that point, whatever year it was, 88, 89, or 90, you had no knowledge that, that that was going on. So to you, it just seemed like they're just a couple coworkers that are having something going on. He's claiming that she broke his antenna in his car, and that's just that. Well, I, I thought odd at best. Odd at best. I mean, yeah, and, and it, it, even if, in my opinion, even if she did break his antenna off, Mm -hmm. uh, they shouldn't have been uh, as rough with her as they as they were, and she was telling, saying, "Help, Steve, help." And right. Like, okay. It was, it was unsettling. Yeah, I bet. To say the uh, especially since it's one of your own. And the other portion of it was Carl Szczynski and his uh, obvious dislike for me. Uh, yeah. Didn't help either. Right, it's just coincidence that the guy that um, he was the guy that initiated the uh, phone tapping, correct? No, no, he did not. Okay, but he it was uh, please Wisniewski. Was a lot of got a lot of Polish guys up there in Illinois. <laughs> Steve, Steve. <Yeah. laughs> okay, I apologize. Me being uh, uh, Irish and English, I have problems with some of these names. They all sound alike. Okay, so this was not the guy, but he was the guy, though, that kind of, um, uh, you know, was one of that clique, correct? The supervisor yes. clique. Yep. Okay. okay. And you had problems with it. And then he said, we ought to, you know, somebody ought to kill that B-I-T-C-H, and he's saying it about correct. a person who is a deputy, which, which is unbelievable. Okay, but I believe you. I'm not saying you're lying. I believe you. But it's just – I think I'm a little – I think the word is incredulous. Okay. Uh, after that day, did you ever see Robin again? I do not remember seeing her ever again after that date. Okay. Um, I, I can't say that I did. If I did, I would have talked to her and said, hey, what the heck? But yeah, right. I, I don't remember seeing her. All right. So what you're saying is the the best you can remember, and we understand, it's 30 years ago. Over 30 years ago. Right. But to the best of your knowledge, you don't remember ever talking to Robin about that incident in front of your house. No. Okay. Uh, did anybody else ever talk about that incident? Once again, before she disappeared, did anybody else ever bring up one of the deputies being arrested by other deputies? Ever have any conversation with anybody about it? No, I did not. Okay. I, I might have had conversations with someone saying that I didn't know what was going on. It was very cra crazy, but nobody ever made any comments about it. It was just uh, uh, I was working a midnight shift and went to work and mm -hmm. came home and just kind of like it was like, well, at, at later dates I did hear uh, rumoral stuff up, about her and uh, Marquez, mm -hmm. but that's all it was was, was rumoral stuff. Okay, and we'll, I, and, we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get to that. What I want to ask you about now is, did you know about Robin getting fired? I honestly don't remember hearing about it until after uh, she went missing. Okay. So like I, said, I was not, I was please. not in the uh, uh, any of the clicks, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I was a, a midnight patrol officer, and they bounced me all over the place. I mean, yeah. all over the all right, so so I guess what I'm saying is that you would run into Robin once a while, once in a while, 
And my impression, once again, 30 years later, is that after this incident, you never ran into her again. No. All right. So, and once again, I'm not saying you were keeping tabs on her. You had your own things going on. But you never asked, you know, I just don't see uh, Deputy Abrams around here anymore. You know, where is she? That never came up. No, she was working an afternoon shift, uh, so mm. I really didn't. You know, the only uh, contact I had with her mm. was in passing. If, if mm. She was in, in, I lived in Piatone. She was in Crest Hill, which is the north side of Juliet, and Piatone is uh, 30 miles south of Juliet. So it's okay. like the only contact I had with her was bringing her home or picking her up at her house and bring her back to her squad car. Okay. All right, so once again, though, you were not aware that she got fired uh, at all? No, I was okay. not. Okay, you did not know that she got fired. Okay. Um, but you eventually – so we'll get back to that in a second. Uh, being that you now know, of course, you must have found out you've known this for quite a long time. Um, did you know about the lawsuit at the time that she filed it? No, I did not. Okay. Did not know about it. All right. Once again, uh, you're just doing your job. That would be something maybe it would be reserved for the lawyers and the higher up in Will County. Uh, once again, none of your business. We understand that. But I'm just wondering, nothing through the grapevine kind of filtered down to um, the deputies on the street about how this former deputy had gotten fired and now was filing a lawsuit against the Will County. That never got to you. It, it never got to me, and it wasn't that uh, I, I thought it was odd, mm -hmm. and I know I talked about the incident in front of the house, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I figured, well, I, I, at the, actually, I probably figured that she screwed up, but okay. uh, I, it was like not something that, All you right. know, getting somebody else in business at that time was like uh, suicide, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> okay. So I just want to, once again, just to be clear, and I, I, sometimes I have to ask these questions a couple of different ways, just to make sure the listeners understand it. Before Robin disappeared, of course, we're, we're going to get to next, is where you were the guy who got the call to go to the house to fill out the missing persons report, coincidentally, once again. But before you showed up at, at uh, Robin's parents' place to take the report on Robin going missing, you were not aware that she had already gotten fired from the department. You were not aware that she had a lawsuit against the department. No, I did not. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move up to October 4th, 1990, uh, maybe even October 5th, uh, depending on when you showed up. But you were the one, um, we, we've already been through the details of Robin's disappearance. We're not going to do that now because you were not a party to that. Of course, her family uh, was the last to see her, et cetera. So we're going to go right to this. You were the one who got the call about a missing persons report. When did you realize that the person was, uh, at least at the time you thought, a current deputy and a, a woman you knew? When did you figure that out? As soon as I went to the house and they, they told me it was Robin, I know Robin. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. they, I didn't realize she was back living in uh, Beecher. I thought she was still in Crest Hill. I, um, I was not aware that she was living in uh, with her parents. Okay. Until I got. All right. So you're on. So just to maybe for from a deputy's point of view in Will County, how did how does that work? I'm not saying you have to remember that exact call on that exact day, but I, I am going to ask you what you remember about that night. But how does that work? You're out on patrol. You get a call. What happens? Well, they didn't put Robin's name out over the air. It's just, just go take a person's report. Okay. Uh, we have to so when I, when I realized it was Robin, I was like, oh, wow. Well, they didn't know. I believe her father, I might have been told that her father would saw her in passing when she was going mm -hmm. west and he was coming east. But uh, – and, and I also might have read that in the reports too, but I'm not sure what my initial reports did because I don't didn't have access to those things ever again. So okay, and we're, we're going to uh, get to that, and we're going to get to that. Okay, so you uh, show up there. I, I just have to ask specifically: Do you remember that that night? I remember going there. Yes, I, uh, I do remember uh, that portion of it, but I don't remember anything specific about. Uh, Anybody saying about Tony Marquez or, or any of that nothing, nothing. stuff? So that, that, okay, that so, changed my mind later when people were talking. So. All right. So 
I'm guessing then you show up, you figure out it's Robin. I'm sure you said something to her parents were like, you know, I know her. I gave her a ride home a couple times. Uh, I remember seeing yep. her in the office. I'm sure th I'm guessing those kinds of statements popped up. I'm guessing. Yeah, had, I'm had to. I'm sure they did. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not uh, unobservant not to wonder what the heck happened. You know, it's like um, I, I didn't even know anything about where she was last seen, which I found out later that she was uh, seen someplace at a gas station or something like that mm -hmm. um, on the east mm -hmm. or west side of the Okay. Uh, if you can remember this, and this I think is still a big question mark in Robin's disappearance. Uh, ever been able to establish where Robin actually was going that day? No, I, I was not. No. Um, the assumption after the fact was that she was going to see Tony. Okay. Marquez, but that could be just that's, the S2. I, that's, I don't that's, know. The, we, there's I no proof that. of that. There's what I guess I'm asking is when you filled out the report, uh, I'm guessing that one of the questions is, okay, well, you saw her leave the house. Where she? Do you know where she was going? I'm guessing that might have been a question. I, I, I'm sure I did ask that, mm -hmm. but I do not remember what, my, what they told me. Okay. Uh, I'd be lying if I said they did because I, I don't. I wish okay. I did. Though. Yeah, okay. And, and we'll get to why that, that's a question here in a little bit. All right, because I think that's still a very, you know, big question in all of this. Um, just in general, if we're to think, if, if, if we're to think um, Tony Marquez had something to do with this disappearance, and being that she was having so many problems with him, why would she go to see him? So that that's still a big question mark. That, but, that, that makes no sense. That really does not. Yeah, uh, I agree. But once again, you've already stated at that time you don't remember Robin's parents saying anything like, well, you know she was having a problem with your department. You know that she had a, a lawsuit against your department, anything like that. You don't remember any of that. I, I do not. I wish yeah. I did. Okay. Uh, I, I, would, I would love to see my, my report, my missing person report. Um, but actually, I don't have access to that. Yeah, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't think anybody – Yeah, I don't think anybody – yeah, I don't think anybody does. <laughs> um, all right, so I appreciate, and I pre Steve, I appreciate your honesty. It would be very easy for you to say that to kind of, you know, to, to feed into that, but I appreciate you just being honest. Thank you. Okay, uh, now I, I do have to ask you this, though. Being that you were uh, filling out the, coincidentally, uh, you were the person that got called, you were the one that was there at the house, while you were filling out that, the report, and they're giving you all of Robin's information. And even when you went back to your car and, and left, did at any time did you think back to that incident when you saw Robin being pushed into the squad car from like a year before or however long? Did that ever come into your mind as if her disappearance and that could be connected? You know, I, I wish I could say I did, but I, I don't remember because – I know that I took a, a, a did an addendum to that report where her uh, car was found in I was Markham or Harvey uh, area on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't I don't know if it was that night, but I do know that uh, the information I received was inaccurate. Uh, I, I know I put down a, a, the part I do remember. And the reason I remember that is it was brought to my attention when I was in investigations that. That I had the type of tow truck wrong, mm -hmm. the color of the tow truck right. wrong in my report. Um, I don't know how I, how I got that information. I'm not sure if it came from one of my supervisors or because I didn't go to Markham that I know. So. Okay. All right, but to be clear, you – right, and, the, and the, what he's talking about, listeners, is that originally it was described as a red tow truck, but it actually ended up being a black tow truck, Right. Black tow truck with a chrome bumper. Yeah, right. Thank you. Now, to be clear, though, you were just the, the the deputy who took the report. You were not the investigator on her case. Maybe eventually you became an investigator, but at that time in 1990, you were uh, just a deputy. Just a patrol deputy, yes. All right. And so what is the process? Uh, once again, I'm guessing maybe police departments all over the country are a little different. In Will County, you take uh, – Maybe I should ask you that. To that point in your career, five years, how many missing persons reports do you think you took in those five years? Just the best guess. I 
not a lot because there weren't that many people that went missing. Usually right. the missing persons report would be uh, young runaways and kids like that, so yeah. not that many. Not that many. to know that uh, how to report the reports and to fill out the paperwork and what paperwork went where, but that, that was about it. Okay, so maybe would you say less than 10? Probably, yes. Okay. All right, so you were not the investigator, but what is the process? You take this report, um, of course, you know, maybe these days everything, of course, is electronic and the Internet, and, of course, police have their own uh, system these days that they use to automatically send information all over the place. But in this case, it's back in the days of pen and paper, you bring the report in. What is the process then that starts once you fill out that report and bring it back to headquarters? Uh, basically, well, we were working on the eastern side of the county in uh, in Crete. We had a substation there uh, that would have uh, had me get on the phone, see if we didn't have cell phones, and call the central dispatch and give them all the information, and they would type the uh, information that we knew into the leads database, database uh, so that we put out there that, that she was a missing person with all her personal information. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So then, being that she and her car are missing, you know the license plate number. You know everybody is looking out for her. Allegedly, yes. Allegedly, right? Allegedly, but that's the idea. I mean, that's the general idea. Yeah. You send it in there, and right. then everybody, the dispatcher, sends this information out, and anybody that's on patrol anywhere will be looking for this red Dodge Daytona uh, with this license plate last seen here. Correct. Okay. All right. And how and who became the point person uh, for this investigation of her disappearance? Uh, I believe it would have been uh, Investigator Terry Kreimeyer. Okay. And I just have to ask you uh, what you knew about that particular person. Any concerns there? No. Very upfront. Uh, did the job by the book. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a good investigator. I worked with him in investigations when I finally got uh, promoted to investigations. He, he did a real thorough job. All right, so he was uh, a guy that, uh, would you say that once again, being that you did get to know him and maybe, uh, you know, if you had some conversations off the record, uh, was he a guy that was able to avoid the harassment that you got or did he get some of that as well? What would you say? That's my knowledge. I did talk to him about the case, or was discussing the case with him at one point. I don't remember exactly when. Uh, and talking about knowing that I had copies of all the files, or at least I thought I did, and then going back in and trying to recover mm. those files. He says, all my reports that I were typed into the computer are gone, too. So his, re his reports, my reports, wow. uh, disappeared. Okay. Once again, we're, we're going to get <laughs> – listeners, I keep saying this, but we're going to get into that. Okay, but we're going to talk about it more in much more current terms. Okay, so he becomes the point person, and uh, like we've already stated in the uh, interview I did with Jody, the car was eventually found. We know that a purse was found um, up in Cook County, not in Will County, up in Cook County. Um, we know about this tow truck. We know about this uh, witness who describes the two men uh, that left the truck there, and they do match the descriptions of Tony Marquez and his, what was his stepbrother or brother-in-law, John Romo. Um, did you know about, once you passed this paperwork on to this investigator, did you know about any of that? Did you know about anything that was going on uh, regarding this investigation? Did you know that uh, Tony Marquez's name came up very early on it. Did you once again in 1990, maybe into early 1991? Did you know about any of that, given the job that you were doing? When uh, no, it was just much longer. Uh, the uh, I, I did not even know that Terry Kramer was uh, uh, assigned to the case mm -hmm. initially. I found that out effectively within the last uh, probably. 2016 or something like that. Wow. Okay. Was, you did not know, and, and yeah, even though you worked I, with him, I, 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 even though you worked with him yeah. at some point, that never came up. No, never came up. 
Okay. And I did, it didn't come up until I talked to him to see if he had any report, case reports. And he says, I looked, and mine are gone too. Okay. All right. And that was after that was after, that was after I was promoted and not in the investigation anymore. All right, I, and we'll, and I, I want talk. and I certainly want I will get to that. Thank you. Um, being that uh, so you keep doing your job through 1990, you know she's missing. Maybe you realize, maybe you saw, you know the the missing poster or something like that. Whatever they were doing back then, oh. uh, et cetera. You knew that she was not found right away. Maybe through the grapevine, you heard that her car and everything were found, but. Um, you knew that she was missing. Um, did you ever, at any point at, around that time, talk to your fellow officers about uh, her being missing? Oh yeah, that that's, that conversation uh, came up about the uh, her uh, dating Marquez. So it finally did like come that. up. Right. So it finally did come up. Yes. Okay, and and. <laughs> Part of that was because I was not working out east in Eastern Will County anymore. I was assigned to the central zone, so mm -hmm. a little more uh, people. There was only a couple of people signed out east, so there really was no, not a lot of contact with the majority of the department out east. Okay. So in these conversations, I would never say uh, you have to use their names. In any of these conversations, did it ever come up that maybe Tony Marquez or, or something having to do with the Will County uh, Sheriff's Office could have something to do? With Robin's disappearance, back at the time. Yeah, the only time, the only time that that part of it came up was, for me anyway, was when I did a search warrant on uh, while well, I was in investigation. Yeah, well, I, 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 I that's fine. I, we'll get to that. I'm just talking about at the time. I'm talking about 1990 into no. 1991. Mm -hmm. You, no. um, you know, were having lunch with some other deputy on a break. And you both know that Robin was a former deputy who went missing, and that never came up. No, that never came up. Okay. Uh, did you ever t uh, talk about, did you ever throw around theories with other officers about a fellow officer's disappearance? You know, it, it, it never came up because I, nobody really, uh, in Eastern Will County, nobody really had much contact with anybody else in the department. I mean, we worked okay. that shift most of the time. I mean, at 10 years almost, I worked midnight shift, so we didn't really see anybody um, uh, at that point Okay. to, to have those conversations. Okay. Uh, if I can ask you this, maybe to take yourself away from the department itself, um, uh, I, I think uh, that you were married at the time. Did you ever say, if you can say, I realize this is a conversation between husband and wife, but did you ever say to your wife, you know, you're at home, do you ever say, you know what, I think Robin's disappearance might have something to do with something that's going on at the department? Did you ever say that, once again, at the time in 1990, 1991? I don't remember that, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, I might have had the discussion with her, but mm -hmm. I honestly, I, I don't remember specifically having those kind of conversations. Okay. All right. All right. So she's missing – um, her car is found, the purse is found, uh, but because, once again, you're a little disconnected from it, you don't know maybe a lot about a lot of these things, and like you said, um, you're working a night shift, you've told, you've already said that in the entire county at the time, there might have been only three deputies on duty at the time, so the odds of you running into any of them are, are pretty slim, unless there's some, you know, major call or something, um, and you're just, you're just kind of doing your job, and... Um, you know, I, maybe I should ask you this. Were you surprised when her disappearance wasn't solved, like, right away, like she wasn't found alive or deceased? Yeah, actually I was. Okay. It, uh, well, it just seemed, seemed odd. It was, it was I, I believe the, the sentiment of a little bit that I might have heard was that uh, she was probably deceased or she ran away from from some, some kind of situation. I mean, there was that kind of stuff, even with the guys out east. Uh, we would talk, but there was nothing specific about any particular person doing anything to her or okay. any of that kind of thing. Okay. Do you remember at what point uh, – we've already talked about this, but I want to make sure this is clear. At what point did you find out that Tony Marquez and Robin were having a relationship, and how did you find out? Oof. That would have been when I was working in the central zone, uh, again on a midnight shift. Mm -hmm. And there were some rumors about 
her being found in Tony's office and that they were dating. I'm not exactly sure. There, there was nothing mm-hmm. that I can oh. specifically say Do time you, frame, but it was when I was going to the zone. Okay. Uh, can you give us even a, a, a circa date, like around the idea of the year or date, month at all? Oh, not specifically, no. I Maybe. Could it, it, so. could it have been in 1991? Or could it have been even later than that? You know, it, it probably was later than that. I mean, because I, I, okay. I guess I went investigations in 94. Mm-hmm. But, um, and so it was I, before that. Was sometime before that. Sometime before that, yes. Okay. When did you find out that she had filed this uh, harassment suit, this big lawsuit against Will County? Do you remember when you found out about that? Actually, that was probably when I was in investigations. Um, All right. But it just it, I know that they, when I was in investigations, the um, the case came up once in a while. Uh, and basically for me, it came, we were, I was really, really, really busy. So a lot of people were assigned to the case. I thought it was actually a state police issue at that point. Uh, mm-hmm. Just rumor stuff about uh, her having a relationship with Tony. Mm-hmm. So, right. I, you know, with nothing that I had time to get involved in. It was, uh, right. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I'm just wondering, once again, I've never been a police officer, but what you're saying is that you didn't find out about the, the lawsuit, which seemed like a big lawsuit to me, um, until maybe 95, five years later. Yeah, at least. In fact, I, don't, I don't think I found out about that until uh, talking with uh, Jody, which would have been probably 1996. I'm not exactly sure. Okay, but, uh, so. 95 or 96. Do you think that's uh, because once again, my impression it's a pretty big lawsuit when you know when a fired employee is you know filing a lawsuit. You know, usually that's the kind of thing that trickles down. Do you think you didn't know about it once again be, because they were trying to keep it under wraps? I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, I I didn't I did not deal with or have any direct contact with anybody mm-hmm. uh, in, in power. Nobody, but they weren't my friends. I didn't. Uh, Work for him. I went to work, did my job, and left. So it was probably, I, I might have known about it in 95. I don't okay. specifically know for sure. And actually, I didn't. The only contact I had with uh, the family was, let's see, I was in investigations and I was in a domestic violence um, seminar uh, that Glasgow put on, and uh, Robin's mother was there with a, a poster and and I was like, oh, it's heartbreaking. Uh, mm-hmm. But didn't know anything. I don't, I don't believe I knew anything about the uh, uh, lawsuit until um, I, I hooked up with Jody. And that was so how did how that happen? Okay. Oh, I know what it was. It was uh, through, I hooked up with Jody through um, the reporter, Joe Hosey, from the, um, he would come up to, our office every once in a while and went through files as far as what uh, criminal offenses were going on and arrests and stuff like that. And that's how I uh, picked up with Jody, just through him. Okay. Thank you. All right. So you keep doing your job. Of course, Robin uh, continues to be missing. Uh, there's somebody on the case. Uh, we know about all these this information that was collected, but we know that uh, nobody has uh, been charged with anything. Um, did you know that uh, Tony Marquez had gotten fired in 1990-1991? Were you, were you aware of it? No. Not, not at all. Okay. Once again, we realize it's not your job to keep track of everybody else's career. But I have to ask oh, no, these, you, you know, I, I'm just wondering uh, if these types of things, you know, what kind of things get through the grapevine and what time time kind of things don't. All right. So you continue with your job. You've talked about how you became – uh, uh, an investigator for Will County in 1994. Um, how would you uh, did? Would you say that things in the department kind of maintain, maintained the status quo as far as things going on? You know, uh, that what I would call crooked or you know power hungry people. Would you say that continued? Yes. I mean, well. No, it's hard. Yeah, it, it, it did because 
I had another friend of mine that was a, uh, he had helped me get into investigations and he uh, put, put a good word in for me. I was a police, part-time police officer in Piatone with him. His name was Dennis Susie. He's now deceased. But he had full connect, 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 whew, sorry, political connections, uh, but not on the uh, dirty side. Uh, he would talk to me as being a part-time police officer and a fireman in Piatone, and then working for the county. Uh, I would talk to him about, on the fire department about some of the things that were going on. He would talk to me about some of the dirty things that were going on. Um, and that was with one of the sergeants out east and uh, one of the deputies out east where they were actually running, uh, getting paid while they were working to run escorts for semis through Will County from a, a mob guy called Albert Taco. Wow. And that was that was going on when I was working there. So it's, uh, that I was aware of. And I know that uh, uh, Dennis was always trying to find something to arrest Arthur Burchette for. And he used to talk about him uh, and how he, he was involved with the, uh, uh, what you put it? Tri County Auto Theft Unit was helping them as a, an informant, and uh, it, it was it, it went on. I just wasn't mm-hmm. direct. Okay. Um, well, the being that the, being that you brought the mob up, um, we should go back to something that um, Jody and I talked about. Once again, the tow truck. It is believed that the tow truck that dropped Robin's car off, this um, witness, was from a trucking company owned. Uh, or run by the mob, the Messinos. Are you familiar with them? Were you, uh, I'm sure you had heard of them. Yes. Yes, that, that came out of the uh, search work that I um, obtained, and we served on Arthur Richard's property uh, in Governor's or on Governor's Highway in Moni, Illinois. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm asking here uh, is, does it surprise you that um, if we're to believe that John Romo? And Tony Marquez were the people driving the truck. That's what the witness said. That's the, the witness picked them out of a lineup. That's officially on the record stuff. I'm not making that up. And that they were driving a a tow truck owned uh, a towing truck company run by the mob. Does that surprise you? I I was not aware of that until just recently. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. That or at least I don't didn't remember until I read some of the stuff today. But that's not what I was told. Um, okay. And, what were you told? I was told by Arthur Burchett. Well, there was a couple of things. Arthur Burchett said that he he told me that uh, in after his search warrant on his property, that uh, he told me about the relationship with Tony Marquez and uh, Robin. He mm-hmm. said that they used to come to his house and look for to see about him building a race car for Tony. Now, Art, you have to know Art Burchett is a liar mm-hmm. in a thief. All right, well, let's, <laughs> the, let, uh, before we get into that, uh, I, I want to come back to that. But I just – what I guess I'm asking you, uh, going back to that the, the, the preceding question, is that – um, once again, it's on the uh, you know it's on the record. It's not something that unfound found out on its own. These are things that have been established by Jody and others. Is that this this tow truck uh, was um, one that that was a company from a company owned by the mob. And what I'm saying is, do you think it's a coincidence that here we have Tony Marquez and John Romo allegedly in this truck dropping Robin's car off a uh, car off? And then you're talking about how a couple other uh, deputies in Will County are helping the mob with some issues, trucking issues or whatever it was in Will County. Are those two things separate, or do are we starting to see a pattern here? Your your opinion? I honestly do not know because this the story that Art Burchett told me. All right. Well, let's, uh, well so you fun. so all right. Hold on. You just don't know, and that's fine. If that's your answer, totally fine. It's just I have to ask the question. But people don't know who Art Brichette is, so we need to set that up. Uh, Art Brichette, who is he? Why did you run into him? You talked about this uh, warrant or whatever it, that you got, everything else. Who is Art Brichette? Art Brichette is a, uh, how would you put it, a uh, 
small time criminal that kind of was on you know, had contact with the uh, Arako and a mob and uh, car thieves and um, he was kind of ran along the outskirts uh, with the mob. Um, he was tight, but I don't know how tightly he did a lot of his own thing. Basically, he ran. <laughs> Found the Tri County Auto Theft found out that he was the one that was uh, stealing tractors, larping land, trying to tractors and combines and stuff like that, and then uh, turning them in for the reward from John Deere for finding these half a million dollar pieces of equipment until they figured out that it was him, and then they stopped working with it. Um, Okay. Yeah. He was just so he would steal the tractors and then they'd put out a warrant and then he'd turn the tractors in to get the money. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. Well, everybody got to make a living. Okay. So would you say that would you say that Art Bruchette was well known in Will County? He had a he was infamous. Oh, absolutely. Yes, he was. He was. Okay. He was. okay. Would you uh, uh, would you say that uh, with his dealings, his criminal dealings, et cetera, would you say that he was on the fringes? Of uh, the Chicago mob, you would have a business with them occasionally. Yes. Okay. All right. So we have Art Brichette. He's kind of um, I don't know if I'd call him a small time criminal, but he's known. Uh, people, I guess, in law enforcement know him. He gets in enough trouble for people to know him. Uh, does maybe he's not? I guess not in the mob um, or anything, but he maybe has occasional dealings with them, being they're all in criminal activity. And what happened that you and he, um, you ended up meeting him for, uh, of course, of purposes of an investigation, and him talking about Robin and Tony Marquez. How did that all happen? Well, it started out basically uh, doing a domestic disturbance report with his son. Um, they had a lot of domestic violence crap going on over there, and his son, who had only one leg, which sounds strange, wow. came to me, called me up, and because we had a past relationship with going over there when I was in patrol, uh, he called and talked to me and said, my dad's been beating me with, with his with his false leg, Oh my! and so I did move forward, <laughs> so, and then uh, later on he called me because uh, this abuse supposedly to happen, and I got information from Art Jr. that his father had stolen property uh, all over his, you know, uh, construction materials, stolen cars, a stack of uh, um, non-registered uh, titles for stolen motor vehicles um, that he had uh, hooked into an electrical supply. Uh, from his from the pole to his neighbor's house in the middle, he built a berm for the guy. With the guys that uh, to that he hooked up electricity to his house that was not going through a meter. Wow. Uh, so that was the basis. The statement from his son was the basis for us doing a search warrant for stolen property, uh, theft of labor, stolen guns or guns, but that was no Floyd card. Um, I'll you. Okay. So All right. So you serve the yeah. search warrant. What Art have to say? Well, he goes into it also. He admitted to all the things without an attorney there. And then during the process, uh, then he tells me about uh, um, the, the stuff with Robin Abrams and Marquez coming to his house. Hmm. And then he also, while still doing the interviews with him. Uh, he tells me about him and another gentleman having, uh, and I'm not sure if it's the same day or not, but because uh, I kept trying to keep in contact with him, get a little more information to kind of spark my interest, uh, Marquez and Robin situation, because she was still missing. And he tells me about a conversation he had with the two, with Clement and Dickie Messino uh, at a coffee shop. And I'm not exactly, I don't remember where, because those reports are missing too. Um, where Messino Butters told him that uh, they were the ones that dropped Robin Carr in Markham or Harvey. And mm -hmm. so I went into the 
did a report on that and indicated that the um, tow truck was a black tow truck with a chrome bumper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and right at that point, when I still had art in the uh, office, I found out this other guy's name, which I don't know who it is, and he swears he doesn't know who the person was. But if, but I do know that he was in uh, the municipal correctional facility in Chicago um, at that point. So I called up there and found out that he was actually talking to a Secret Service agent. I don't know what about. And I asked the Secret, Secret Service agent uh, to ask him if he knew any, any information about a a missing deputy. Mm-hmm. And that's all I said. And the Secret Service agent took back the same information from this gentleman that Art Rochette told me about the Messina Brothers conversation over coffee mm-hmm. and that they're the ones that dropped the, the uh, truck. All right. Uh, so was this the first time, once again, it had been roughly six years since Robin disappeared. Is this the first time you ever heard about anything regarding this situation, regarding the dropping off of Robin's car? No. No, I, I did hear about uh, them picking a the car up. Mm-hmm. Not about dropping it off. The information I got—I don't remember where I got that from. If it was from okay. um, one of the sergeants or whatever, because I wasn't there, so I didn't uh, uh, have that information. There okay. later, more information developed, but uh, um, that was not until I was actually retired. Okay. Did you, when you heard all of this, hearing about Tony Marquez, and uh, you know, I guess this would have been inf- new, you know, new information to you. He's telling you about all this. Um, did you begin to suspect that possibly uh, Tony and others were responsible for Robin's disappearance? The rumor mill had that's what it was. Uh, I knew through uh, gossip on the investigations that uh, mm-hmm. um, there was some indication that she was seeing him and then coupled with the stuff that Art told mm-hmm. me uh, it made sense, and mm-hmm. I went to the crime area at that point, too, and told him about uh, what Art had told me. Uh, I'm not sure if he did any reports on him, because he says all his reports are gone, too. Um, right. But in the interim, um, we got a visit from uh, Chief Moss. Deputy Chief Moss was in charge of investigations this time. He brought me into the sergeant's office, and there was a an investigator. Uh, I swore he said his name was last name was Donovan. In the uh, what it ended up being was uh, Ken Copus. Uh, right. I, I didn't know that until much later. Later, but he was the one of the um, people that was in charge of Robin's investigations and what sparked their interest. But we should be the, clear though, Ken Copus did not work for Will County. He worked for the Illinois State Police Department. Correct. Right. We have to be clear on that. You're bringing up a new name, so we have to establish that. Uh, did you know that there was an investigation at the state level regarding Robin's disappearance? Did you know that? I, I knew that it was being transferred to them uh, or had been transferred to them for a conflict of interest kind of a thing. So that was because she was a deputy and uh, all the other stuff with Marquez. And, mm-hmm. and so there would be a looking at it. That would, uh, but the reason that Donovan or Copet showed up was because the information in my original report said it was a red tow truck, um, and Art was telling me that it was a black one. Well, apparently they knew that it was a black tow truck with a chrome bumper that um, dropped off the mm-hmm. Robin's car. So they uh, came down to the invest of the department and talked to me. And next thing I know, I was ordered to give all the reports that I had. And I found out with uh, with my interview with uh, Art and the social social ticket service agent that I talked to with that information as far as the man that was there being interviewed by them to Chief Moss, who again then, then allegedly gave it to uh, Ken Copas. All right, so you collected all this information, and all of a sudden John Moss tells you to cl- give all this information to Ken Copas, who is with the state police. All right. Now, though, we need to go back to Art Bruchette, though. He tells yep. a story about, though, his property and how there was some digging on it, and it just happened to involve John Moss. 
please tell us that story. When did he tell you all this? You know, I, it was sometime after he was arrested and not arrested. Um, I, I don't remember what I was there for initially, but he talks about a, um, <laughs> it was just odd, an area that he, on his property, which was off of Cottage Grove Avenue and the Crete area, it was a big wooded, uh, a part of the wood was wooded, and he used to go and dump his grass in the end of the circle, and there was a depression or something was buried there. Uh, he did not tell me who was buried there. He says he didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, but he also told me, and we knew approximately where it was at. So I went through the, uh, we, we sort of looked over around the area, and we set up a, um, with the highway department to bring a, scraper and scrape the top layer of the soil off so we could see where the soil was disturbed. When we got out there, it was a consensus search. We got, I made a contact with the owners of the property, which was along, it was actually the property alongside of our property. To the, where was it? North, I believe. And the lady gave me permission to search it, signed the uh, consensus search. We went out there today to do the re uh, dig and our, our, our John Moss showed up, Chief Moss showed up on the property and told us where we were going to dig. Uh, myself and uh, Ed Hayes, who was the an ID tech at the time, we both told us, Chief, that's that's just a grain tile. That's not, well, you're digging there and this is over and done with. So we dug there. What year was this? What year does this not, did this happen? It had six, maybe early 97. All right. I looked for those, but of course I couldn't find those either. So. Okay. So when this, uh, being the John Moss, the same John Moss uh, that told you to give all your paperwork over to Ken Copas, and we'll get to Ken Copas, uh, was this before or after uh, the dig? No, this, the, the, the dig was after uh, my paperwork was given to. Uh, okay. The dig Ken was Copas. after you gave the paperwork to John Moss ordered uh, you to give your part, your your paperwork to the state police. So after that, then you, uh, you know, Arpachet says about, you know, I think somebody might have buried something on my property. You or somebody arranges for that place to be dug. Then John Moss says, shows up and says, no, you're going to dig over here, not over there. Correct. Yeah, all he right. canceled all the equipment. Okay. The highway department. So. All right. Do you did he ever give you any reason why he did that? He was there with a reporter from the uh, female reporter from the uh, Herald News, which is unusual too for a search warrant. I see. Uh, it, it was, uh, but the, the the next year, after the election stuff, I think it was Fitzgerald was in office. He was no longer um, deputy chief. John Moss. We, that's, we, we have to be clear on this. John Moss was no longer deputy chief. Correct. Okay. Um, and we got permission again to go out there and search, and we scraped off the top of the soil, found the other depression with uh, it was probably six foot by three foot with overturned soil, but there was nothing in it. Like there was a grave there one time, mm -hmm. at least that was at uh, uh, myself and Ed Hayes' experience that there was a grave and something, but there was nothing in it. Is it so. your once again your opinion that? Uh, so one, we, we just need to be clear on something. So John Moss tells you not to dig where Art Bruchette said. He tells you to dig over someplace else. He never gave you any um, reason why he didn't want to dig where Art Bruchette said. He just said we, we actually argued with him a little bit and mm. said, "Well, I can I can bring Art Bruchette out here and uh, so you can just, yeah. he, he said, "I don't care. It's not happening. Dig there and you're done." Uh, John Moss, would you say that he was one of what, what I've referred to so far as the clique? Would you say that John Moss was one of that clique? He apparently was. I, I didn't know that at the time. I thought he was a pretty decent guy, but honestly, until that point. Okay. Um, so then your impression is, though, that when uh, leadership changes and John Moss is not in that position, the, the new guy uh, does allow you to go out there and dig in the proper spot. Is it your opinion that something could have been moved 
between the time you were out there where John Moss wouldn't allow something to be dug and then the second time when you did get to dig in the right spot. Could something have been moved in that amount of time? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, uh, the, the listeners will, you know, and we, uh, you know, I guess what we're trying to say here is that here Art Bruchette is talking about Tony Marquez and Robin Abrams. Robin Abrams goes missing. Uh, we believe that it was a mafia uh, tow truck that dropped their car off. Art Bruchette has connections to the mafia, and he and Art Bruchette is claiming at some point in the past he believed that somebody buried something on his property. Correct. Correct. All right. Uh, you should know that uh, the, the two gentlemen that <laughs> gentlemen, it's an odd term for them, uh, the Messino mm-hmm. brothers, uh, they were uh, Chicago police officers at one time, and they were indicted and consequently or subsequently um, convicted. Of, uh, what was it that they were running a, uh, a drug ring uh, and racketeering, and ended up in. At the time that we were doing these search warrants and stuff uh, on the property, they were in uh, Federal Penitentiary in Colorado. Mm-hmm. We also get permission myself and uh, uh, my partner, Tech, so he used to work in Harvey and was aware of the Messina brothers. Uh, we tried to get permission to go out and talk to them at in Colorado, and our department said no. That's all. Do you find that unusual? Yes, I do. All right. I do. Uh, uh, do you, can you? With, all right. I, I guess what I'm asking you is, um, think about any other big uh, um, crimes, things like that, of, that happened in Will County during all of your years there. Um, and as an investigator, I guess from '94 on, were, did they allow you to go to other states to interview criminals? Oh, absolutely. With the uh, Tom Morrison and myself again, we were partners at that time. They, they sent us to Florida to do background on uh, Timothy Buss, who's the one that uh, was convicted of murdering, or he had been it up for his convicted of uh, uh, murdering uh, Chris. Uh, what's his first name? The second name. I think it was Christopher Meyer. I think it was. I, I could be mistaken. But we went down there. I mean, we were, mm-hmm. were down there for a week. So, all right, so it was not unusual. Uh, I'm not saying it, it happened all the time, but usually when it was thought that you or some other investigator needed to go to another state to interview somebody for a crime that was committed in Will County, usually that was allowed to happen. But in the, what you are saying is in this particular uh, situation with the Messino brothers, going to Colorado, what Art Bruchette said, and all that stuff put together, in this particular circumstance, you weren't allowed. Correct. And we, and we corroborated with another police agency, which was the, I actually recently, or a couple of years ago, uh, called up MCC to try to find out uh, uh, whether there was other information that I got received to see if I could find that report when I found that report was missing, because I thought I had those copy of all those reports at home, and went through and I found the file with her name on it, but nothing in it. <laughs> And I keep saying we're going to get to the missing file stuff because I want to I want to cover that topic uh, in total all at one time. I know that's probably the fourth time I've said this during the interview, but trust me, listeners, it's coming. Okay, so Art Bruchette says all of this, but it seems that John Moss uh, got in the way of a proper uh, dig going on. We don't know, and, and as you said, Art Bruchette is a known liar. Who knows if he's just making stuff up? On Unfound, we talk many times about criminals who will create lies just hoping that something's correct so they might get a break on their sentence or just to get out of jail for a day. So it very well could have been that, yeah. that Art Bruchette was doing that, and he really, you know, who knows what, he, you know, he could have just been saying stuff that he heard through the rumor bill. We just don't know. But is your impression, you were the one that was there, that at least something used to be buried in the spot that Art Bruchette was talking about. Now, here's the other part, uh, and I think we're, you know, kind of painting a picture. You talk about how... Um, some Will County deputies in another part of the county may be doing favors for uh, the mob regarding trucking or something. Uh, you had told me about something having to do with a racetrack uh, with some people in Will County uh, making money off of that in, in the department. Art Bruchette is connected to the mob. Uh, the, um, the Messino brothers, it's 
possibly, most probably, their tow truck that deposited um, Robin's car, what was it, where it was eventually found. Um, you know, I, I start to see a picture. I'm not making any of that up. Uh, is it your impression, Steve, that maybe part of the department in Will County was mobbed up? I believe so. It's like, and re, re, part of the reason I know that uh, uh, one of the sergeants that was in charge of Eastern Will County, uh, I hate to bring his name to his death, but um, <laughs> his flashlight was found in the trunk of a of Arthur Shett's brother-in-law, whose name escapes me, I down here someplace. Um, but he was a, a mob guy. His car was on, on, on fire with him in the trunk, and in the trunk along with that was the flashlight of uh, my father, my former father-in-law. With uh, the cow light was in there with the sergeant's name mm-hmm. etched on it, and the trunk was closed. And uh, cause I know this because of uh, a friend of mine who was the sar- sergeant in investigations at the time was out there and told me about it later. That uh, basically, and, and also my ex-wife used to talk about of uh, the mob guys, including Albert Taco, coming to her father's her stepfather's house for New uh, Year's parties and Christmas parties, uh, along with John Johnson, with with. Uh, you have to say you can name these. You have to name these names. Who's John Johnson? John Johnson was the undersheriff when John Shelley was um, sheriff. Okay, so John Johnson, uh, John Johnson. We have to remember Shelley was the guy that extorted you way back in 1985, Correct. and John Johnson would have been his underling at the time. Correct, and then he became sheriff also. Okay, John Johnson, Johnson became. Johnson. So okay, thank you. After. Shelley. Okay. So, um, and we just ha- and if the listeners are saying yes, he did say that your former father-in-law could have been uh, was uh, what position did he have in Will County at one time? He was, he was a sergeant. He was also involved in, and I know this from another investigator. They suspected him of running. Uh, uh, there was a guy by the name of Billy Dauber who was a mob guy. Mm-hmm. Um, was on trial or uh, for something I'm not even so sure in Will County, and on his way home from there, his car was uh, vehicle was shot up on, on I call it I think it was Money Manhattan Blacktop, headed east, and uh, allegedly, according to one of the other investigators, uh, my father-in-law was uh, involved with it as, as far as running Eastern and block on that highway so they could stop his vehicle and kill Billy Dauber and his wife. No, uh, once again, we have to remember this is your father-in-law of, of an ex-wife, and of course we know how those things can be. We're all adults here. Um, does that surprise you it's that your father-in-law could be involved in something like that? I wouldn't surprise me, uh, every, because he worked at the – he also worked uh, as a uh, – uh, guard or something at the racetrack, which was uh, Balmoral at the time. Mm-hmm. He would come home uh, waving wads of money that he supposedly won't like. Nobody runs, wins a tight trifecta three nights in a row and it has that much money. It's like that just doesn't happen. So, not in my world anyway. Uh, uh, once again, I realize she's your ex wife and I hate to get into personal conversations, but I got to ask did your wife ever and you ever talk about that? Oh, yeah. Did she think that yeah, her we, we did she think it. that her father was mobbed up? She told me she's the one that told me that uh, uh, our talker was at her house. <laughs> All right, and we have to remember he yeah, is so once again to remind once again. I don't want to throw too around too many names, but we're going to do it. Taco is another mob guy. Correct. He went to prison and he's dead okay. now too. Okay, so. Uh, once again, just my impression. We don't talk about the mob too much on Unfound, even though we've covered almost 200 disappearances. We did talk about it uh, during uh, a, a case we covered in a disappearance in New Jersey in 1974, uh, a Nicholas uh, Masucci, who was con- kind of connected to the, some of the New York mob at the time, and maybe his disappearance has something to do uh, with that. 
Uh, in fact, though, uh, we have to believe it's something else. But we don't talk about it too much, but uh, we're certainly making up for it in this conversation, Steve. Uh, it just seems that it, it, it keeps popping up. You know, these names keep popping up, and I think that's the you know I think that's the reason that even to this day, 30 years later, that um, many people believe that Robin's disappearance is certainly does have a mob connection somehow. I'm not sure about that portion of it, but the the guy that was dead in the back of the car where the with the car uh, was burning with the sergeant's flashlight on it was his last name was Desandre, Desandre, which was Art Burchette's brother, which he was wow. he was definitely mobbed up. Okay. Now we should also say you charged you were we have to remember why you were at Art's place in the first place because of what his son said. You had all these things against them. Did Art ever go to jail for any of them? Nope, they were all dismissed by um, um, they were, I don't think they were even actually charged. He was arrested, but uh, I, I pulled his uh, um, records out of the county clerk's office and it shows that he was not charged. They were all dismissed. All the charges were dismissed. And they were all felonies. Do you have any knowledge why he was never charged with any any of it? No, I do not. I, uh, can, I, I wondered about that. That I recently pulled it up. Uh, can you even um, begin to guess why? Because <laughs> he was mobbed up. Okay. And, <laughs> and well, okay. If you're going to say that, then uh, you know. Are you, uh, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not agreeing with you. I'm just trying to ask the questions I think my listeners would ask. Then that would mean that there would maybe be somebody in the prosecutor's office or something that doesn't want to, or maybe Art Bruchette is some sort of uh, informant or snitch or something like that. He always has been, he always has been in, in that uh, venue as far as being uh, an informant or a snitch. Mm -hmm. uh, like with the like auto task force or um, – in that group, that's what he did. That's how he made some of his money, like with the tractors and um, mm. combines being found in places how he do all that. And they finally figured out that he was the one who was stealing them. Right. But they couldn't prove what he sold them. Okay. In your opinion, as the person who was there and, and uh, arrested him and everything, do you believe there was enough evidence that could have sent him to jail for the charges that you made against him? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Commonwealth Edison found the uh, when we pulled the, the electrical part. That portion was a felony theft for, for one. Mm -hmm. uh, when we when Comrade came out and pulled meter off the uh, outside of his house, only one, literally one light bulb went out. Mm -hmm. The only light bulb went out was the one that was by the furnace downstairs. Found. Um, obviously st stolen property, and it was all the same stuff that uh, our son told us and where it was at. He gave us a death time over all, we found all the ammunition, which he didn't have a Ford car for, uh, firearm owner's identification card, he possessed mm -hmm. it. Uh, that might have been the only misdemeanor. Uh, stolen bathtubs, uh, stolen car motors, uh, mo more than enough. More than enough. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I don't I, I don't know much about the rest of it. Once again, I, I've never been a police officer, but coincidentally, um, when I lived in Las Vegas, I did know a guy who was an investigator for the power company, Nevada Power, that they would go out and investigate, you know, theft of, you know, if the, if the company thought that somebody was messing around with lines and everything. And I know they're pretty hard. You know, they don't mess around. You know, if the electricity is being stolen or something like that. My impression was always that they, you know, they have their own investigators because they specialize in knowing electricity and everything. At least that's the way it is in Nevada. So it surprises me that he would get away with something like that. Just what I know about the investigation of stealing electricity in Las Vegas. Huh. Well, he bypassed any meters by going yeah. directly to the cables from the pole between the pole and his neighbor's house. Yeah. And that takes the guts. <laughs> well, I guess it does. And once again, I'm, I'm surprised that whatever the power company is in that area would allow a charge like that just to be dropped if they knew about it. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We got you. Okay. Um, you, however, you continue to, even though um, – 
Uh, you continued to talk to Art over the years after this, correct? Yes, I have. All right. Just to try to get more emotion out of him, to get him to slip up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. um, so far, he has not um, What would you say the general tone of all those conversations? The very first time I had one of those conversations with him, he asked me if I was recording the conversation. Okay. So he uh, hesitant to talk to me. This is Art. I'm trying to find out, and I always told him, I said, Art, I'm trying to find out where Robin is buried. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I wasn't up in that medical set for those times. Uh, I told him I have no interest in anything except for putting the family. Mm -hmm. Right. Right where she belongs, but where she is. So okay, has 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 Art ever offered up his own theory, being that he's the one that's saying about the burial site and everything else, Tony and, and Robin together, et cetera. Has he ever given you his theory as to what happened to Robin Abrams? Yeah, he he spit out a, uh, and I think it was just a way to get me off the point was that she, she was throwing a pig farm in mm -hmm. uh, rural Beecher. And yeah, there was a pig farm in rural Beecher where it was at, but as anybody knows, pigs eat everything. They, uh, the only thing that might be left of anybody would be teeth. So. Okay. And I, I backtrack and find a pig farm, but. And yeah, it, well, that we, and yeah. I, I, the listeners don't. Up. Please continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. And the, the the thing about that particular pig farm is that uh, Art knew those people. Uh, they were friends with my former father-in-law. Oh, boy. Um, and I, and I don't remember the exact circumstances as far as how I backtracked that, but, but I did. Um, huh. See in my notes where I talked about that. I I okay. The listeners may be on their own probably hear about uh, pig farms and wood chippers and things uh, on their own. We don't usually my – li my guests behind the scenes uh, you know, talk about it quite a bit because that's somehow those rumors uh, seem to permeate uh, quite a few disappearances that we cover. You know, I'm inclined to dismiss all of them. I think those come from Hollywood. Yeah, I but um, I, I will say that it is at least interesting to me that your father-in-law was friends with – a guy who did own uh, one of those types of farms. I, I guess what I've said over the years, I've heard so much about pig farms that if you believe every one of these stories, I would have to believe that every pig farmer in the United States you know, has been involved in a bunch of disappearances, right. which of course I don't believe. So at some point you have to start drawing the line between what you believe and what you don't. So I'm not sure what to make of that. But my, what my, is important to me is that Art does believe that Tony and others had something to do with Robin's disappearance. I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. All right. I, 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 he. Uh, I have to say, just uh, as a note, that mm -hmm. I was surprised by the reaction of my father-in-law uh, when I told him what that was. Oh, by the way, Art says hello. He about had a heart attack. He's not here, is he? You didn't tell him where I live, did you? So it's like, and went on like that for about ten minutes. I'm like, wow, that was I an see. interesting reaction, but. He is. He's special. Okay. Um, your father-in-law, did he, being the, you know, you, you've painted him to be uh, not a fine, upstanding citizen. Did he ever have to answer for any of this stuff? No. Okay. He did not. All right. Let's uh, move on to this. Um, let's move on later. So that's all 96, 97, the digging Art Bruchette, and I know you continue to talk to Art Bruchette, et cetera. Um, let's move into the 1990s, into the 2000s. Um, the state police investigator, of course, his name popped up in 96 when this dig was going on, Ken Kopis. Um, he worked for the state police. Um, I think what I can say here is you've uh, portrayed him, at least in our conversations off the record we're going to talk about now, as not being the straightest of shooters either. Why don't you talk a little bit about Ken Copas? <laughs> That's another story. Uh, when I was helping a friend of mine with his, he was a bit for uh, running for sheriff in 2014. 
I was trying to help because he's, he's a good guy. Yeah. But I decided I had heard rumors about uh, Ken Kopitz's uh, bad behavior through his career. So I um, did a FOIA, which is a Freedom of Information Act mm-hmm. uh, request. And they actually sent me the disciplinary records of him. And he was involved in uh, numerous things from stealing or running a, uh, what do you call it? I wish I could say it with a, a, trying to read through here to figure it out, but he was given like Ministry of Leave with a, a lady that was a court reporter. Um, she was receiving payments for personal prescribed federal organized crime drug task work uh, over here tapes, and he was getting kickbacks for that. Uh, he was involved with an investigation down in, oh crap, I don't remember where it's at here. But multiple disciplinary problems. Wow. So, and he worked for. So this is in Will County. This is the Illinois State Police. This is Illinois State Police. He worked. Uh, um, let's see if I got to see. Yeah, I, I've got. I, could, I can give you those documents. I don't remember. Exactly. Okay. All but right, but he was. Uh, he, but just he was uh, uh, crooked, correct. and he worked for the Illinois State Police. Correct. All right, and. And the reason we're talking about this is because, as you've already said, he somehow became responsible for Robin Abrams' disappearance at the state level. Do you happen to know when he became responsible for her disappearance? Uh, I know in it was either ninety six or what, what, it was probably ninety six when we did the search warrant our Prochette's property, and that report came out. Mm-hmm. That's when he showed up um, at. Will County Investigation right. Unit, uh, and was given my reports. Right. Just copy my reports. Uh, I guess I'm wondering um, how long he was on the case before that date. I honestly do not know. I All do right. know that recently I found out that there was a a report, and it was just through I found out through uh, a guy by the name of Dave Marviano, who works for the State's Attorney's Office, where Ken Copas heard um, Tony Marquez's wife make the comment to. Uh, Ken, that she knew that Tony killed Robert. Is that uh, right? Yeah, we've talked about that. Uh, um, how, when did you find yeah, that out? Just just recently. I mean, it was uh, probably in uh, a year or so ago, or two years oh, ago, wow. maybe. Very, very recently. Okay. And... Um, Dave Mark Viano, who was the investigator for the sheriff's, or the, uh, at that time he was the investigator for the state's attorney's office under the current, mm-hmm. I can't think of his name. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, he says that report existed in the spot. He told me that when I tried to get a copy of that report, they wouldn't release it. So, so somebody, once again, uh, this, so this is coming, this isn't some rumor on the street. This is com- coming from somebody in the state attorney's office who said, that there is paperwork out there somewhere, hopefully somewhere still, where Tony Marquez's wife at the time in 1990 at some point told an investigator, ten, told Ken Copas, despite him being crooked, that she believed that her husband killed Robin. Yes. Did, did I get that right? When, asked, I? And when asked why, and she said that he told her he did. Okay. Once again, this is coming from somebody. This is not some rumor that we're, you know, coming from some meth head or something like that, or somebody that's looking to, you know, some cellmate who is looking to get out of jail uh, for a day and get a nice lunch just because he says he knows something about a disappearance. This is somebody in the state attorney's office. Correct. Okay, Tony Marquez's his wife, but uh, we should know Tony and his wife are still married 30 years later. That's what I hear. Okay, yes. Once again, I know you're not keeping up on these things, but it's my job too, and they are still married. Okay, so, but Ken Copas, we have to remember, though, is a crooked guy too. So, you know, I, I you know, I don't know. You know, it, it'd be better if all of these guys were Boy Scouts, you know, that, that we could believe them. But, um, but that's that's what a state, in, state attorney said, and I know that uh, Jody has also told me that She's heard the same thing, you know. So, 
um, that's something. Um, Ken Cope is, uh, after that 1996 uh, where you had to turn your paperwork over, did you have any dealings with him after that? Oh, yeah, I've, I've met with him. I um, recognized him and realized he was because he was hired by the Will County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and I think he was in charge of the investigation division in Will County until um, until he well, he, he was running for a sheriff went against a, a friend of mine uh, on the Republican ticket. And uh, I met him at one of the, the Republican Party fundraisers that I was there, and, and he called me by name. He remembered who I was. Huh. And I'm going, oh, that's, that's Donovan. That's, that's the guy huh. <laughs> from investigations. So... Yeah, you uh, for some reason thought his name was Donovan. Was he like undercover or something? That was his undercover ID for where he was working with a drug task force. Okay. For and, stuff, and that's part of the problem with how he, how he got in trouble with state police and got uh, disciplined numerous times. All right. And then after that, though, Will County just scoops him right up. Yep. <laughs> all right. So, okay. So I, I hate to laugh because it's not funny at all. State police uh, just. State police decide that he's no longer fit to work for them, but Will County will just hire him as soon as as quickly as possible because his cousin or somebody was working for Will County. Correct. His cousin was the sheriff of Will County. And what year was that? Oof. Uh, let's see. Paul Copas has been out of office for at least three – Four years, six okay. years, so and did two terms, so back in 16 years ago. Okay. All right, so they scooped him right up. Uh, where is uh, Ken Copas uh, retired now? What's he doing now? Do you know? Yeah. Oh, he, uh, Ken Copas is dead. He got uh, uh, cancer and died. Oh, my. And I never got a chance to talk to him. Never got a chance to what? To talk to him. I always talk. wanted to go talk to him. So. Okay. Now, we also, something that uh, that popped up also regarding Ken Copas was, uh, I guess now what is a very well-known double murder in the state of Illinois that was solved and now it's unsolved again, that also re involved Ken Copas. This was uh, uh, the murder of a, one, a, a couple, their last name was Rhodes, uh, killed in their home Correct. while they were in bed. Um, we don't want to get too much off on this tangent, but Ken Copas was – involved the investigation of that, but the, the guys who were charged and went to prison for the murders Correct. were eventually let, let out. So w w can you go through that maybe just a little bit, what you know about that, Steve? Uh, I looked into it a little bit. I, I know about it, but I remember specifics of it. I'd have to look at the paperwork to, to remind myself. I mean, I, I know it happened. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see if the place. Um, I was going to send that information to you. I've got a whole file on that one. Okay, well, but, I'd still uh, like I'd still like to see that. Uh, but Ken Copas was involved in, involved in the investigation of this double murder. Uh, the woman who was murdered, I'll just do what I remember off the top of my head, was involved in somehow in Illinois state politics, and um, there was an investigation. Two men were charged, and I don't remember the names. Were charged with the murders. They went to jail for several years. In fact, one of them was on death row. But then he got his his uh, sentence commuted to life. But then they got lawyers, or there was some innocence project, something like that, that took up their case. And eventually, both guys were let out of jail, um, and they won lawsuits against the state of Illinois um, because they thought that the investigation was crooked, that that these two guys were framed for the murder. And so this murder went from being solved to now in 2020, it is unsolved. And Ken Copas was right Correct. in the middle of all of that as an investigator. That's true. Yep. So uh, yeah, if anybody wants to – there, and there's, there's been a book um, written about it by a guy, Mike Callahan, and I listened to that interview that you sent with yeah. um, yes. who, who had a lot of things to say about the, the crookedness of that investigation. Um, I think he was transferred and lost his command posts. Uh, over that one, which is not nearly enough. Mm -hmm. Ken did. Right. So if anybody wants to look it up, uh, they could just do a search for double murder, the last name Rhodes, R-H-O-A-D-S in Illinois, and they will find uh, – they can look that up. And I think you will find Ken Copas's K-A-U-P-U-S is his last name. Okay, so 
Uh, he's, he's responsible for Robin's disappearance. Doesn't sound like he's obviously a crooked cop. Doesn't sound like much of an investigator. And so even not only is there Will County who has their own maybe reasons to make it one all go all away all go away. Ken Copas might have had his reasons to not want to investigate it too seriously either. Okay. We're finally going to talk about your paperwork because several times you've stated, I tried to get the paperwork for that and it's missing. I tried to get for the paperwork. Why don't you, let's just talk about the entire topic right now, Steve. Um, why don't you explain that to listener to the listeners about, you know, how much access should you have to cases that you worked out on over your career and what has been your experience, et cetera? Yeah, usually everything stays in the system. I can't imagine how they even got it out of the report system. Um, I make copies of all my reports from my own file and had them in my lock file cabinet at uh, uh, in the investigation division, and then I was promoted in, I think it was October of 97, and just took everything home with me. Because uh, it was, I had like 240 open cases. It was just like I couldn't, if they were worth looking at, um, farther I would, and, and same thing with the other guy that was working with me all the time, he uh, did the same thing, and uh, they just started gone. They're gone from my, my file folders, Actually, I think I still have the file folder in my little box of stuff from the county, and there's not one report in it. Not one. Not one regarding Robin's case or not one regarding any case? Not one regarding just Robin's case, which was unusual because they didn't get the report that I have uh, with uh, of the search warrant on um, mm -hmm. our shut our, our... still there. But, okay. But they didn't get to take that one. Who would have had access to that information? <laughs> um, the deputy chief, which would have been John Moss. Um, uh, as far as they, 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 those reports aren't even in the the file, the none of the reports they did are in the main computer, as, as far as I know. Because I tried to get FOIA copies of the reports, and they say they don't exist. So. Is it your impression? Once again, there could be something else going on here, but once again, from your experience, all the years that you worked there, all the, the of course, you saw probably in your time frame computers becoming more and more prevalent, you know, for filing reports and all the work that you went maybe from doing it on a typewriter to doing it on a computer, et cetera. Your impression is that those that all that information should be there. It should be there, yes. But it's not. But it's not. Okay. Um, and, my files, please. Not there. Okay. Have you <laughs> ever gotten an explanation uh, at all from anybody? Nope. Okay. Uh, uh -huh. Have you ever? When was the last? When did you start uh, finding out that the files that you thought were there weren't there? I was approached by um, who was it? Uh, one of the guys I used to supervise, uh, Mike Mack, and he referred me to. Uh, uh, one of the investigators or the uh, ID techs from uh, the Illinois State Police that processed Robin's car, um, and because he had information, and I said, "Yeah, I still got my files." I went down to the file cabinet, which was I don't know what it was March of oh crap, can't think what the year it was. But anyway, I went down. It was a uh, <laughs> and my file folder was gone. I mean, my file folder was there, but there were no reports in it. None. No. I went through every piece of paperwork well, that I had that I, I still had sexual assault case, cases that I had. Um, just a second piece of information that I had developed that uh, it, I had copies of all that kind of stuff because it irritated me because I was never able to uh, work and I wanted to stay in investigations and at least close the cases out or give them to somebody else and explain them to uh, explain the stuff to them what I saw and what I knew, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't have those cases anymore because I shredded them, but the ones for, from, our, or from Robin Abrams are gone, including my original missing persons report. Including the report you wrote in 1990 when you showed up at Robin's parents' house? Correct. When, and once again, when did you find this out? What year do you believe this was? Two, three years, something like that. It was uh, two or three years. 
Is yeah, it? Then, let's see. It'd be, it'd be at least two, three, maybe four years. Okay. Is it possible? Um, let me let me just give you uh, a, a for instance. Is it possible that back in 1996 that when you had to hand all your stuff over that they just gave it all over, you know, and it's been in somebody else's hands in the state police's hands since 1996 when Ken Copa showed up? No. no. I, could, I I purposely made copies of the stuff mm-hmm. and gave them to my the chief. And the chief gave them. This was Copus was okay. not there when I. All right. Them. I okay. Them, so I, had them. I thought I had them. All right. So what you're saying is, you made copies that Ken Copus took with him right around the, because of Art Prechette, but then the originals. Then somebody went in and took those. Correct. Okay. Uh, you were once again being when you started when you discovered this three or four years ago and and everything else. Have you? Have you maybe done a test to see if there's any other cases that are missing um, that come to mind uh, in your in your you know where they should be or anything like that? Well, I have not. I've, I've spoken with the state police, the new investigator, which is uh, Anna Wazalution, uh, about some of the information that disappeared. Uh, mm-hmm. And touch base with her because uh, when I hooked up with uh, when I went to talk to Jody about the things that some of the things that I did not know about, which is the, the lawsuit and um, the fact that she was arrested and had pictures of her in, in uniform and mm-hmm. uh, some of the, things, the reasons she filed the lawsuit, um, that, that's when some of this stuff came up. And uh, I talked to her about it and I talked to uh, she, she got a hold of uh, Aunt was it? Was it Houston, uh was a, a Reporter from Channel Two News here uh, was uh, Talet Talez. Got it written down someplace. Mm-hmm. Anyway, did an interview with her. Van, uh, was Van, yeah. Right, right. And um, you sent me, you sent that email to me. You sent me that letter or whatever it was to me. Yes, and I got it. So you, uh, once again, as of December first, twenty twenty, you don't know where those files are at all. No, I do not. The only other odd thing too is I did talk to the ID tech. Dexter Barclay, and he told me that they found a print on the inside of the her car that belonged to one of our deputies, actually one of the sergeants at the time. Uh, that information I gave to uh, Anna Wazolution, or Detective Wazolution, and she said she checked on it and that's incorrect. But this, uh, I'll say please, investigator swears. All right, you're gonna have to speak up a little bit, Steve. You're kind of getting muffled a little bit there. So, okay, just. just uh, uh, they, they came back to one of our our, our deputies, actually one of our sergeants. Who? And uh, if you could say the name, please do. Uh, it's actually a shirt tail friend of mine. His name is uh, Jimmy Carson. Uh, he, was it, in, he was in investigation at the time. Yeah. He was. He says he told the uh, state police or told the Texas Barclay, which is the um, the uh, ID tech that processed her car, that he's never inside her car. And he says Dexter Barclay's told me that they found the print inside Robin's trunk, where's where they found the camera also. From, or maybe the camera's on the backseat. I, I might be mm-hmm. lying about that. So you and so you know this guy, and he says there's no way that my print is in in the inside of that car. There's no way that should be possible. He he told Dexter Barclay that he was not inside mm-hmm. the trunk of Rob. Okay, but the ID tech says that the print inside the print is his. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> what what do you think about that? Well. The the odd, only odd thing about well, there's a lot of odd things, but Jimmy Carson, he uh, <laughs> I got subpoenaed by uh, the state police or state attorney's office to testify um, to, what, to, a, uh, to the Robin Abrams case that uh, mm-hmm. Wazolution and uh, Adela were working. Uh, this was in. On the 16th of April, 2014, I've got a copy of the uh, right subpoena in my hand here. Okay. Um, I went in there with my counsel, 
and uh, which is unusual because you, you usually a former police officer or uh, or police officer they don't subpoena them they mm. give them a summons to come in and right. testify. So it looked like to my attorney that it was uh, um, they were looking to uh, charge me with interfering with a criminal investigation by the state police of the for interfering with their investigation. So, but when I brought this to the attention of uh, Jimmy Carden in front of somebody else, he says, well, if they, they call me and they subpoena me, I'm just going to plead the fifth. And my thought process was, why would you need to plead the fifth? You supposedly don't have anything to do with this. Right. So, just odd. And, well, did he, well, I have to ask, did he get subpoenaed? No. He didn't. He did but not. you did, but you, his, so... Just to set this up, why? Uh, first of all, maybe we need to establish this. Why was this grand jury set up in 2014 anyway? Well, my attorney thought that it was. I thought it was initially to be um, to, to give testimonies of information that I knew about uh, the Messina brothers um, mm. and that information. Uh, my attorney went in there with me because at the suggestion of. Uh, another friend of mine was running for the guy who was running for sheriff, and he says he, that they don't do that. They don't he reiterate what they already do. That subpoenas aren't given for because they know you're going to go in there and testify. Yeah. You have to tell the truth. You're supposed to tell the truth. Um, so I got an attorney. Attorney went in there with me, and they changed the uh, you know they, they touted that it was a. Uh, supposed to be a summons, and they sent a subpoena instead, which is crap. That doesn't happen. Yeah. So. But why? I, I'm I'm asking you, why was this grand jury set up in the first place? What was the goal of it? To get more information on well, supposedly to get more information on the Robin Abrams cut trial yeah. the case. Okay. Missing for how much time? Yeah. Um, the more information I had to share was what I shared with you already. Right. So okay, so that's what. So they were giving they were, they were an attempt, and the listeners, or the, at least uh, I've posted this in a couple different places already. Was this? Uh, you've talked about Anna, and you've talked about this investigator Padilla, who worked for who? State police. State police. All right. And the uh, Dexter Bart Bartlett, I think it is a Barclay or Bartlett. He was uh, the tech that processed Robin's car. Right. But these two uh, people, Anna and this other guy, uh, went to talk to Jody, and I had posted a what you might call a transcript of their interaction with her. And uh, the Padilla, or Padilla, however you pronounce it, uh, is fairly combative. But this happened in 2014 when this grand jury, being that you mentioned them, this was all going on, that she was that Jody was trying to give them information, and they didn't want to take it. That's correct. All right, and that has been posted uh, in the discussion group and on the Facebook page, and people can read that transcript for themselves to come to their own conclusions because if you read that conversation, um, and I probably should get Natasha to post that on the website as well. I'm thinking out loud here. Um, So everybody, you don't have to have a Facebook account to read it. You can read it for yourselves and see that transcript, and it it just doesn't seem at least like uh, Investigator Padilla or Padilla – one well, really wanted any information regarding Robin's disappearance. That's the impression that I get. That's true. Okay, that's, that's true. absolutely true. Okay. I, I saw. I, I looked at the. Jody showed me the copies of um, notes that Tony Marquez. That if you look at them, it looked like he was stalking her and not the other way around. Right. That's right. I mean, that's right. Yeah, we should, you know, and I think that's, uh, yes, Tony has tried at the time in 1989-90, he was trying to portray it as this, as if Robin was stalking him. That's the way he tried to portray it. Um, right. and, and that, uh, you know, she was like um, Glenn Close in, in that movie, she's stalking Michael Douglas and burns the rabbit in the in the, in the boiling, what, Fatal Attraction. Something like that, that which coincidentally came around, out around that time. But, um, I think there's enough proof here to show that it was somewhat the opposite. 
Um, so what was your experience? So you did go to this grand jury. Uh, did you feel like they were trying to pin something on you? Well, my attorney came up and went in and talked to the, um, oh, I don't remember what the uh, state attorney that was handling the, um, and talked to him for extensively. And then the state attorney that was handling this process came out and in front of the grand jury said, we want to inform you that uh, former police officer uh, in room is not the focus of this investigation. So apparently they must have thought that I was, otherwise they wouldn't have had to say that. Right. Hmm. And how did your time in front of the grand jury go? Did you, uh, I, sh I should I ask you this, did you get the impression just from what you experienced, I knew you would not be privy to anything else that happened there, did you give give the impression that they really were trying to to bring charges against whoever caused Robin's disappearance? It was my opinion or my feeling that the grand jury people were generally asking specific questions to try to make sense of all the uh, inequity, the uh, bad things that went on. They um, were very similar as far as questions you gave me too. They were direct. Um, they, they well thought it out real well. It wasn't just like some mm. willy nilly. Uh, so, but nothing came of it. And yeah, because that was 2014, and here in 2020, and nothing's been done. Uh, are, are you uh, are you allowed to talk about your grand jury testimony? I really, you know, not. Are you allowed to talk about it six I, years later or what? I I don't know. Um, I don't know what the result was, and what the result was. I've never seen any documents other than the fact that they subpoenaed me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was considering from what that I haven't already told you. Yeah. Um, we, the, according to and above me on the, the grand jury, according to. Uh, Detective Margliano from the, uh, or was with the uh, attorney's office, that um, he talked to, and this is third party or fourth party information, that that report, it was erroneous, that report didn't exist. And he, after he already told me the report with uh, Ken Kovas uh, saying that Tony's wife mm -hmm. right. uh, admitted right. that she heard what she heard. Right. And also so the, the the change was also that the print inside the trunk of uh, Robert Robbins' car was not Jim Carter. Mm hmm And also that the uh, – what, what else? was the third thing. Uh, I guess I have to – I don't want to get you in trouble, you know, because sometimes I think that sometimes grand jury uh, proceedings are – sealed and everything, but I, I just want to ask you one question. Did at any time, did they ask you uh, about Tony Marquez and whether he could have had anything to do with Robin's disappearance? Was that topic ever touched? No. Okay. All right. Um, do you have any idea how many people they called to testify during this grand ju jury proceeding? I didn't see anybody besides myself that was involved with the uh, uh, with the uh, Anawa Solution and uh, mm -hmm. Padilla, I don't know if they testified or not. Uh, okay. I was out. Okay. Another, another, they they testified about some other case too, but I don't I don't have no idea what that was. So. Okay. So uh, my impression then is you still don't have any idea why you were given a subpoena to show up, and it wasn't just a summons. You don't have any reason. I. My attorney said that looks like it's going to focus on you interfering with their investigation. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know that the uh, uh, Animal Resolution seem to be doing a good just thorough job, but they, it kind of surprised me that uh, after we had already searched the area um, next to our Pritchett's property for any, any evidence of a body, uh, they came out there were, with a dog, and it's, by the time it's, it's a swamp, and we're looking through it again. It's like it seemed like a waste of uh, time and effort. I mean, it was just like I told you this this area was where we dug down 
six feet through that whole area. Yeah. Found, found where the grave was or whatever was there buried, but it wasn't there anymore. So it made mm. no sense. Okay. Um, how did you and Jody Walsh end up um, meeting up? You know, uh, and and talking, and uh, of course, she was talking about you way back in in, in way back in 2016. And I think uh, you know we we do things same but differently uh, four years later. I think maybe back then we probably should have had you on back then. But like I said, I was kind of new to all of this at the time. But how did you two eventually, um, you know, run into each other and strike up this I know friendship that you have now? Was it? Uh... Joe Hosey from the Herald News, mm -hmm. uh, who I was friends, acquaintances with and uh, friends who he came up to investigations all the time. And like I said, trying to uh, get information as far as any new cases uh, and that type of thing. He did a story on Robin, or several of them, I believe. And he asked me if I would be willing to talk to, to uh, um, Joey. And I said, absolutely. If there's any way I can help, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that came about. And then uh, Roseanne Tez uh, from Channel 2 News also came up to um, Joey's house, and we did an interview there. Over pretty much the same things that uh, I talked to you about. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, because she is the one, the listeners should know, she is the one that put me in contact uh with Steve and uh that's how he ended up being on on the program. That's that's how it, it it's gone on. Um you had also sent me uh something that about the the Cindy Shervino who is a private investigator, at least that's what she calls herself. I don't know if she's licensed or anything like that. I don't know her. I've never spoken to her. But you sent me something regarding the work that she did at one time uh regarding Robin's disappearance. And uh, she had a similar story. Uh, you couldn't find your records. It seems she couldn't find any records either. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? That was kind of a – and I think this is another one where I got hooked up with uh, through uh, Art Brichette. Not Art Brichette. Um, uh, Tom Police Officer, my brain is going is a muddle <laughs> right now. That's fine. And, uh, it's from, That's fine. A guy by the name of uh, Scott Ozentowski from, uh, what's the call, buddy? Right. Oh, Mike, Mike Mack. Okay. He, he was another one that went on with the investigator from uh, um, the ISP, and uh, which is just Dexter Barclay, and then the, the Cervino and a guy by the name of, uh, I can find it. Anyway, it doesn't, that part doesn't matter. But basically went over the same things. I had a list of things that uh, she brought up that I looked at, and I was like, some of the names I don't, don't remember even seeing, except for my handwritten notes that I think I sent you. Um, it, it, she, went, she did a lot of uh, legwork with the stuff, and she didn't get any place. I guess she talked to a, um, a state investigator that basically ushered her out the door was a rude right. person. I knew that part. Right. Lockwood or something, I think it was. And uh, well, Scott Ozentowski, it was his business. He, she was an investigator for uh, Scott. He was a small police officer at uh, a small town north of Creek, Illinois. Um, yeah, and she pretty much went over the same things that we did. Mm -hmm. she, yeah, I, I believe she said something about a box settles that uh, might have seen Robin at a gas station in Orland Park. Right. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what all that was about. I don't have that report in front of me, so I can't uh, really Well, let me let about. me jump in here, and maybe I can just sum it up, being that I read it last night, uh, Steve, is that what it, what she did was she was trying to track down what I found the, the, the most interesting. Yes, she, uh, she allegedly, none of us were there, she was allegedly a ha harassed by two um, officers for Illinois State Police. She was going down there just to introduce herself, and they took her into an interrogation room and made fun of her, her words, and uh, about her trying to figure out, you know, what happened to Robin Abrams, and just did not take her seriously at all. Once again, her words. None of us were there. 
But uh, and I will by the time the people hear uh, our voices on this Friday, December fourth, twenty twenty, I will have posted all of that so people can see it um, on the website and elsewhere. But what she also said was that she was trying to find the transcripts of or transcript of Robin's uh, deposition regarding her case against Will County. She went to multiple people who would have had uh, who would have had access to that. Uh, court reporters, et cetera, none of that can be found either. Yeah, I, I did read that. I do remember that that, that, uh, uh, that same scenario that you're talking about. That's very accurate. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it is odd because it just is, oh, it's the whole situation is just It is. Odd but, but I think, I guess what I'm saying, I'm seeing a theme here. You go to try and find your records regarding your work, regarding Robin's disappearance when she became an, an investigator, uh, all of that, even the, the original missing persons report, it's not there. And to this day, you have no idea where it is. She goes and tries to find the transcripts of a deposition that Robin gave in her, char in all, in her work or her charges, or um, the deposition she gave against Will County regarding the harassment, illegal termination, and everything else, she can't find it. The attorney, the attorney's office that represented Robin can't find it. It's all gone, all of it. Doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Okay. <laughs> doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Well, that's what. That's all. I'm just. Re all we're trying to do is report the facts. Uh, you know, that's why I ask the questions and everything else. So, there is a theme here. There is a huge, huge. Uh, theme here, and I, I I happen to believe that both of those things are connected somehow, some way. But um, so there's that. So Cindy Shervino, I've not had a chance to talk to her. I know that um, Jody would like me to, but um, uh, we've not had a chance to uh, meet up or talk yet, unlike Steve and I, who have been talking for a couple weeks now. I don't know what to make of that. But that's what Cindy Shervino uh, said regarding that. Um, regarding all these people we've talked about, uh, Shelley, uh, the guy, you know, the, the, of course, the, the sheriff at the time, his underling, Johnson, um, the guy who tapped your phone going way back to 1985, John Moss, all of these people, uh, did any of them ever get in trouble for anything they ever did that, that you knew about while they, were, while they worked in, in Will County's sheriff's office? No, not to my knowledge. Did all of them get to retire with their pensions and everything else? Yes. Just like you did. You being the good guy, straight cop, you got to retire with your pension. They, the, the power-hungry ones, and crooked, I would call and corrupt, uh, they got to retire with their pensions too. As far as I know. Okay. They're all retired. Okay. Great. And they're still uh, somewhere, I don't know, Illinois, you know, living out their years, their retirement years. That's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, that is exasperating. Uh, uh, it's just, um, and I, and I, the listeners, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in my summation, but I, I have to tell you that um, if we were to believe that that Tony Marquez and others had something to do with Robin's disappearance. I have to say that my impression of why it happened has matured a little bit since my summation in 2016, but I'll leave that for the summation. Um, let's move on to this, and we're just about done with this interview. It's uh, almost three hours long, but I think the listeners now understand why it's this long. Um, you're a retired investigator. You have experience. I mean, in a in a you know, in a in a big county, in a major U.S. state, uh, in a big department, very near Chicago, et cetera. What's the best way forward uh, for Robin's disappearance uh, as we get close to the year 2021, over 30 years later? Uh, where does it need to go? What what you know, uh, outside of um, torturing people, which we can't do in the United States. Maybe if this was North Korea, we could do that, Steve. Can't do that in the United yeah. States. Uh, what what need what can be done? What what can be done after thirty plus years? Well, they could they could interview uh, Marquez off the side. They can go back and interview Mrs. Uh, Marquez. I can't remember what her first name is. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there, the other portion that really concerns me is guys like Bob Brown, John Johnson, Sergeant Tom Carey. Um, they, those people should be re-interviewed because they, and John Moss, they have to know something. Mm-hmm. They have to know something. And uh, there, was a, there was another investigator in state police at the same time around that uh, 1996 uh, time frame that I, I, I don't remember his name, but I believe John Moss actually gave that file to him directly to take to Ken Copas. Uh I don't know why that sits in my head. I cannot remember the name. I remember the guy's face, but that would be something that would be looked into to find out what he he might have done with those reports. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to ask you a question. Maybe this is just something that I get out of um, you know movies and and Law and Order, but it, it surprises me. Though there there definitely seems to be a mob angle to this, because you know, just for a, a few different reasons that the listeners have heard. I'm surprised, certainly since 1990, some of these mob people have gone to jail, and it's amazing to me that none of them offered up information, uh, you know, to get some of these police officers in trouble to get their own mob, you know, the mob guys reduced sentences, including any information that would have concerned Robin's disappearance. Is that just something that I have as an impression simply because I watch too many cop movies and things? Or is that something that you think is realistic, and are, and are you surprised by it as well? I, I I think it's realistic. I mean, I've seen enough evidence of of bad behavior, criminal behavior. Uh, I mean, it it took um, the state police uh, up until, according to Anna Wazalution, she actually went and interviewed uh, uh, Dicky Mm-hmm. Uh, he's still his brother. His brother is dead, and he claimed, according to her, that he doesn't know anything about it. So it leaves a lot of open questions. I, I, I'd like to take. Well, shouldn't say that. Uh, have a heart to heart with Art Burchett, mm-hmm. a serious one with Art Burchett, and Tony Marquette and myself. I'm not a police officer anymore, so I could probably get away with that and not uh, uh, mm-hmm. get any. Unless they want to charge me with interfering with an investigation again. But uh, mm. I do know, as an interesting side note, that uh, when Joe Hosey went and pounded on uh, Tony Marquez's door and his wife came to the door and uh, he asked her if he could talk to Tony, she sat on the door in his face. And this he is the report. We have to remind the listeners maybe Hosey is a reporter. He goes to talk to Tony Marquez, obviously about Robin's disappearance, and the wife wouldn't let him in the in the house. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, and we should know, note that Robin was not the only woman who got harassed in that department. Um, there are stories, at least, of one other woman who got sent to a psychiatric ward from what she suffered. Correct. That's correct. That was Linda Bolts. Did you know her? L-T-Z. I, I worked with her for a couple of days. I was, she was my training officer for a couple of shifts, and that was about it. Wow. She seemed like a competent, uh, decent person, but that was in 1985. I can remember that one far back. I wasn't aware of that stuff until later. I have to tell you, Steve, it's amazing how they were able to do these things and nobody else finding out about them. Now, I, I you know, I... I, I don't want to think, you, like I said, it sounds like you had enough things going on just with yourself and what they were trying to do to you to you know, even concentrate on anything else, that any any harassment or anything that anybody else was getting. But, um, you know... Well, I know I slept, slept in my bed with a, with a gun under the pillow for a long time. They broke into my house they, uh, numerous times just as a... Uh, what do you call it? Gaslighting or gaslighting? Yeah. Harassing. So, um, it was it was creepy. It was actually when your fellow uh, officers you know, are breaking into your house. Correct. Um, was, uh, uh, may, uh, uh, we probably should have covered this when we when we were talking about the t- phones being touched. But uh, would they? 
break into it, or were they manufacturing keys, or how were they doing that? Do you know? No, honestly, I do not know how they got in. Uh, they, I, they, they, I know I, there were some people that had the ability to pick locks very well uh, uh, in the county. Like the one incident was I was sitting and watching TV on a couch with uh, a girlfriend, and all of a sudden realized there was a flashlight or a big lantern flashlight on shining into uh, from the inside of the house that reflected into the my house was in the bed coming through the back door and left the door open when they locked. And it was locked. I was very uh, wow. cautious about <laughs> my door's locked. So that was just one of a, a couple instances. The other one where they came in and um, threw papers all around the floor and uh, looking for I don't know what and uh, took flowers. And I, had, I wrote, wrote, at that time I was raising roses I enjoyed. Uh, gardening and stuff like that. And they picked all the petals off the flower and threw them all over the uh, house and came home to that after a midnight shift. So, but the doors also locked. And uh, you were married at the time? Did you have any kids at home at the time or what? No, no I, I was not. I was divorced at that time. All right, so you were living by yourself? Yes. All right. Wow. But you knew it was them. Did any of them ever own up to that, saying, "Hey"? Actually, I, I thought I thought it was uh, actually thought it was my ex-wife at first, mm -hmm. until a friend of mine in the apartment was getting reports of sitting next, standing next to the uh, uh, watchman's office. There were two doors to the watchman's office, and it was cracked. And there was uh, several individuals in there discussing burglarizing my house. <laughs> one of one of the uh, Lieutenants, or a couple of lieutenants, and uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting. He says, just be cautious. <laughs> They're capable of anything. So I was like, yeah, pretty much scared crap out of me. And going back to that, do you think it had to do with this belief that you were having an affair with some other woman, or do you think, remember, that was the reason you gave for the phone being tapped, but what do you think the reason was for all this? I, I think it was focused around the, um, the the fact that my ex-wife was accusing me of uh, selling drugs, and also my which was actually part of the focus of the, the um, wiretap because they knew the sheriff has the tapes, which put him complicit in the crime of wiretap, and he didn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. So wow. Wow, you were through a lot. I'm surprised you toughed it out, Steve. <laughs> I'm surprised I did too, but uh -huh. I uh, think it, seems, uh, it was a different day and age. Right. I'm surprised I got promoted, honestly. I, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 I have to, I have to agree with you. But I did, I did, I wasn't a good investigator, and I found a lot of cases. Uh, mm -hmm. The people that were in charge of investigation at that time. Uh, knew my worth uh, mm -hmm. as a deputy and promoted me to investigations and it just kind of snowballed from there in, in a good way. I, I should ask you this, being that you were there, uh, what year did you retire? 2009, December. Okay. Did you see, uh, being that the department got so much bigger uh, over that time, you said from 100 to now, you know, 400, uh, did did the uh, culture change in there over that time? Would you say that it became a better uh, department over the time you're there? Maybe be being more people being brought in, maybe diluted all of this. You know that now there were so many deputies they couldn't. You know it. it you know whereas it's almost sound like a little club back in the '80s, but you get to 400, it's a little bit different. And the the unions had something to do with the. Uh, I, I believe uh, keeping your brain straight and narrow as far as uh, the, just randomly disciplining something, somebody for not without cause. Mm -hmm. But there were still things that went on that uh, were unsettling. It's like I had a uh, situation where one of my employees that was supervising in the courthouse, I was in charge of courthouse security, and I obviously was having some problems. 
went to my boss, um, and he he took it that I was trying to harass him. They brought the, my sergeant in and tried to see if uh, uh, she thought I was harassing this employee. And basically, my issue was that he, the guy was suicidal. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He was drinking on the job. Every time that uh, it would come to my attention, I'd send somebody to uh, breath test him, not to discipline him, but to see if I could get him help, because I knew he was having issues. Um, and they tried to say that I was uh, harassing him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he had, so retired uh, a couple of uh, years or so, or two years after I retired, he ended up uh, committing suicide, so, which is what I, what I was trying to prevent. Wow. So. Okay. So things were still going on. Um, would you say that the leadership, you you know, all these people in these supervisory positions over the course of those, uh, what would that be, 85, 24 years, um, did the leadership get better or in your impression? I believe so, yeah. I, I, I believe so. Uh, okay. The, the truly people that were truly bad, I know that they retired. Um, they didn't go to jail, but they, they should have. But, uh, mm hmm it changed for the better. Okay. I hope it did. <laughs> All right. Well, Steve, it's been a long interview. Uh, I think we've covered everything uh, that uh, that we can cover uh, regarding uh, the corruption in Will County and how I think it certainly had something to do with Robin's disappearance. Uh, my impression is that her relationship with Tony was uh, – and her disappearance is part of a bigger story here, uh, and that's how my uh, opinion on this disappearance has changed. But any final words before we complete this interview? No, I think the only thing that sticks in my craw still is the fact that uh, uh, she was due to testify, I think, in a day or two uh, to the um, for the federal lawsuit with the, mm -hmm. the same characters that I was circular, you know, Bob Brown, John Johnson. Uh, I didn't have any problem with Sergeant Kerry, but um, you know, they were all it's just odd that that happened that way. I I, I agree with you. I, I think a lot of people feel that way. Okay. Well, Steve, I deeply, deeply, deeply appreciate you being on this uh, episode in, of Unfound and giving a, a very educated and experienced um, other side of what was going on with Robin's uh, disappearance, uh, the, the culture at the time, you knowing her and everything uh, that you saw before and after. I deeply appreciate you being on this episode of Unfound. No, I appreciate the opportunity. I hope that uh, somebody hears it and comes forward with some uh, incredible information to uh, uh, find her, at the very least. I hope so, too. Thank you for being on the program. Thank you. Take care. And that was my 2016 original interview with the sister of Robin Abrams, Jody Walsh, followed by my December 2020 interview with Steve Knickram, deputy and investigator for Will County, Illinois, from 1985 to 2009. I thank them both for appearing on the program. My assistant, Natasha, and I have posted several new files regarding Robin's case on both Facebook and Unfound's website, theunfoundpodcast.com. I urge you to check them out, because they continue a theme that was established on the first episode in 2016, and then continued with the new interview with Steve Knickram. That theme being, police officers behaving badly, horribly, most likely to the point of covering up the worst of crimes to protect one of their own, and them being intertwined with the Chicago mob. In those files on the website or on Facebook, you will find a private citizen who was trying to help Robin's family, who was cornered in an interrogation room at the Illinois State Police, a transcript of a conversation Jody had with two investigators from the Illinois State Police, in which neither of them wanted to receive further evidence pertaining to Robin's disappearance and the extensive Art Bruchette search warrant that was executed. But somehow, he was never charged with anything. Once again, these can be found on the Facebook page or group 
or at theunfoundpodcast.com. Please go to one of those locations and look at those files for yourselves. You know I don't do theories on these episodes, but I'm going to make a one-time exception. My perception is that the theory regarding Robin's disappearance is the same now as it was 30 years ago. In a nutshell, Robin finds out Tony is married. She dumps him, Tony gets ticked off, and after months of harassment and just around the same time the lawsuit was coming up, something happened during an encounter they had on October 4th, 1990. Maybe it was planned, unplanned, an accident. I don't think we'll ever know until Robin's disappearance is solved. Yet there's still something that doesn't make sense to me. Why would all these veteran deputies and supervisors and lieutenants back up Tony Marquez or Tony Marquez as we called him in the original episode? Why would they all put their positions, their careers, their income at risk for a guy, Tony, who was a rent-a-cop? Well, he wasn't even that, because rent-a-cops get paid. Tony was a volunteer. He was less than a rent-a-cop. Why would all these men put so much at stake for a guy who was a volunteer who simply couldn't keep his penis in his pants? Why at the first sign that Tony and Robin were having issues, why didn't Tony get let go in, like, 1989? No matter if the supervisors knew Tony was responsible for the issues or not, why didn't the sheriff just say, hey, this volunteer, Tony, he ain't worth it? Moreover, why would the deputies take the side of a volunteer over a woman who was on her way to becoming a deputy like they were? Well, Ed, it's the old boys club. They were friends with Tony, etc., etc., etc. I don't think that cuts it. Well, it may partially cut it, but that's about it. No, I think there was something else going on here. In fact, here in 2020, I'm fairly convinced that Robin's disappearance had almost nothing to do with the emotional side of the relationship she had with Tony. This was not a case of just some controlling guy being ticked off that a woman dumped him. Why? Because if it were as simple as that, there is no way Tony could have gotten all those other guys to take part in the harassment that Robin received, no matter how much they were friends and buddies. Why? Because Tony was a volunteer. The only way all those men would take part is if they all thought they had something to lose themselves. This is why I'm convinced that all the harassment Robin received was a way to discredit her, to make her out to be a criminal, a stalker, and an unbalanced woman. Why? Because I think all those men suspected Robin would eventually blab about what she saw while she was part of their clique while dating Tony. And to tie this all together, none of us believe that Robin disappearing during the process of her filing her lawsuit was a coincidence. Yet people, both men and women, are filing illegal termination lawsuits and sexual harassment suits all the time. Really, since 1990, I'm sure one of those lawsuits has been filed every day over the last 30 years in the United States. Yet, how many plaintiffs have disappeared? I'm guessing not many. Thus, I'm inclined to believe that her disappearing wasn't even about the harassment or the problems she was causing Will County in court. Nope, her disappearing was all about the illegal things she knew that Tony and the others were involved in. Why? because the illegal stuff was the only thing that made Tony an equal with all these other deputies. And that's the only way the rest of them would be in league with Tony the volunteer. But when Robin did her deposition, and she proved she wasn't afraid, and that she was believable, the clique was fearful people would believe her 
thus lending more credibility to what she might say about the illegal things she saw, a topic that might just come up in court. Thus, the group as a whole had to get rid of her. Had to. Really, none of them, not even Tony himself, had much to lose from Robin's lawsuit. They'd get a slap on the wrist and be told to never do it again. The county's insurance company would make a large payment to Robin, and everyone would go on their merry way. But not if in the course of that lawsuit, other activities by the sheriff's department came up, especially if the mob got mentioned. And remember... Art Bruchette said Tony and Robin had visited his house more than once and that the tow truck used to deposit Robin's car was owned by a mafia family. But Ed, Tony did end up getting fired. So if the police were so in with Tony, why did they get rid of him? Are you sure they didn't fire him just because they found out he was having an affair with another deputy? Hey, it's a valid point, but I will counter that argument with this. Are we sure Tony got fired? Remember, he was a volunteer. How does someone quote unquote fire a volunteer? Are we sure somebody just didn't pay Tony to go away just because of the close call he caused with Robin? Maybe someone of an Italian heritage? Given everything you've now heard from Steve, doesn't that sound like a much more likely scenario? I mean, really, why at this point would anyone believe anything that came out of the Will County Sheriff's Office in the 1980s and 90s? If deputies could get away with breaking into Steve's house, then surely the powers that be could pretend they fired Tony. When really, They thanked him for his service and gave him a nice going away present. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've been listening to Unfound.